council members can turn on their cameras. We will be starting. Everyone, one more minute before we begin. to see who's all here and it looks like we have great everybody at council member Golder so uh, let's begin welcome everyone good afternoon welcome to our two o'clock session of the February 8th 2022 meeting of the Santa Cruz City Council and I would like to ask the clerk Please call roll. Right. Councilmember Kalantari Johnson. Present. Here. 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 Brown. Here. Myers. Here. Mayor Watkins. Here. Here. Present. Thank you. Uh, we will be starting this session with a presentation item, a mayoral proclamation declaring February as Black History Month in the city of Santa Cruz. I would like to invite uh, those here for the proclamation to turn on their cameras. Brenda Griffin of the Santa Cruz chapter of the NAACP. Pat Willis of Black Health Matters Initiative and Keisha Browder of United Way. Thank you so much for being here today. Have a beautiful mayoral proclamation that I will be reading and presenting to you all in person after following this meeting. And to the city. Um, okay. Whereas National Black History Month in February is a special opportunity to gain a deeper understanding of African American history, to acknowledge the centuries of struggles for equity, equality, and freedom, and to honor the many Black leaders who have contributed to the progress of our nation. And whereas the mission of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, the NAACP, the nation's oldest, largest, and most widely recognized grassroots-based civil rights organization founded in 1909 is to ensure the political, educational, social, and economic equality of rights of all persons and to eliminate race-based discrimination. And whereas the Santa Cruz branch of the NAACP was founded in 1949 to address local housing issues and has worked for decades to promote throughout Santa Cruz County equal economic opportunity, criminal justice reform, environmental and climate justice, civic engagement and education, including awarding scholarships to high school students for most secondary education. And whereas, the Santa Cruz branch of the NAACP and President Brenda Griffin play a vital role in our community, organizing annual community-wide events, provide advocacy and support, and facilitate community connections from which other groups and organizations have sprung, including that the Black Health Matters Initiative. And whereas, this year's National Black History Month theme explores Black health and wellness. And whereas the Santa Cruz County Black Health Matters Initiative, led by Director Pat Willis, has focused needed 
attention and develop community partnerships to address the social determinants of health in our local black community and to ensure our whole community is not just surviving, but thriving. And whereas United Way of Santa Cruz County applied survey research, Santa Cruz County NAACP, Black Health Matters Initiative, Blended Bridge, and the Santa Cruz County Black Coalition for Justice and Racial Equity Advisors commissioned the Santa Cruz County Black Health Matters Spotlight, an initiative that shares data on the social determinants of health impacting historically underserved Black African American population in Santa Cruz. And whereas acknowledging and understanding these struggles for social justice, racial equity, and equal rights in our Black African American community in Santa Cruz can strengthen the insight of all of our residents regarding the issues of human rights, the continuing struggle against racial discrimination and poverty, and the great strides that have been made in the efforts to eliminate the barriers of equality for minority groups. Now, therefore, I, Sonia Brunner, Mayor of the City of Santa Cruz, do hereby proclaim the month of February 2022 as Santa Cruz Black History Month in the City of Santa Cruz with special recognition to the Santa Cruz NAACP, United Way and Chief Executive Officer Keisha Browder, and Black Health Matters Initiative. And I encourage all citizens to observe this month by acknowledging and learning the history and challenges faced by the Black community in Santa Cruz and paying tribute to supporting and engaging the many groups and leaders in the community for their contributions, their strength, character, and perseverance all of which enrich our lives. Thank you. Thank you so much for being present today. Your work is noticed and will continue. You are making history. Thank you so much. Is there anything you'd like to say? Give you an opportunity to say a word. Any of you? Yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, Kat. Go no. ahead, Kat. Brenda, please. Okay. Brenda, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Mayor Brenner, City Council members, thank you so much for uplifting the historical contributions. Uh, and achievements and legacy of Black Americans and those people who are of African descent. Mayor Bernie, you touched on so many wonderful things in that uh, proclamation. I'm so grateful for it and for you. Thank you so much. I do want to ask one thing. I ask you all, as community members, to protect the right of our educators to teach this in its entirety, the good, the bad, and the ugly. Thank you so much for that proclamation. I'm so appreciative. Thank you, Brenda Griffin. Pat Willis. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm so honored to be here today, and I'm so honored to be a part of this community and this work alongside all of you. Um, did write something down to help me articulate that. I, um, I wanted to say that I'd like to thank you, Sonia, our mayor. I'd like to thank, thank every single city council member and leader um, and the city of Santa Cruz for proclaiming and highlighting uh, our American history, Black American history. And I celebrate an honor by celebrating and honoring the future are, of our community and honoring that legacy. Thank you to you, all of you, um, and Brenda, Lisa, and everyone 
who's been doing this work in our community are not here today as well. It's an honor. All right. Keisha Browder. Well, good afternoon, Mayor Bruner, City Council members, our community. Um, as you know, your United Way continues to trailblaze. We um, started 27 years ago with the Community Assessment Project. We run the nation's longest community assessment project in partnership with Applied Survey Research. So it's not a surprise that we partnered again to conduct our county's first quality of life assessment for the Black and African American community here in our county. Um, and we look forward to sharing those insights. We learned a lot. And as you all know, as, as leaders in our community, what gets measured gets done. And so now that we have this data where we've moved out of the other category and we have the data about our quality of life, um, the, the words from our residents, now that we have this data, we look forward to partnering with you as a city to examine policies and practices to ensure that there is a quality of life here in Syracuse that can truly be shared by all. This is a beautiful place to live, to work, to play. And we wanna make sure that it is a healthy, thriving, safe community for all who choose to come here and be a part of it. So thank you for this opportunity. It has been amazing to partner with the NAACP, the County Black Health Matters Initiative and others to get this data done so that we can really take a look at our quality of life and those ways that we can improve everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for being present today. Okay, we will move on in our agenda. I have a few announcements and then we will continue with the regular meeting. Today's meeting is being broadcast live on community television channel 25 and streaming on the city's website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you wish to comment on an agenda item today, call in at the beginning of the item you are wanting to comment on using the instructions on your screen. Please mute your television or your streaming device once you call in and listen through your phone only. Please note there is a delay in streaming, so if you continue to listen on your television or streaming device, you may miss your opportunity to speak. When it's your turn for public comment, press star nine, raise your hand, or press, an, uh, or press star nine to raise your hand. And please note public comment is heard only on items that council is taking action on and not on regular updates and reports. The items that will be opened up for public comment on today's agenda are numbers six through 21 on our agenda. Our agenda is posted at cityofsantacruz.com under meetings and agendas. I'd like to ask the council members before we continue if there are any statements of disqualification today. Okay, seeing none. Move on. I'd like to ask the city clerk to announce any additions and deletions of the agenda. Very nice. None. Oral communications is an opportunity for members of the community to speak to us on items that are not on the agenda. Oral communications will, will occur today, immediately following item 21. I will try and give a, a general time as we get closer towards the end of item 21. If you wish to make a comment during oral communications, please call in 
towards the end of item moonlight. I'd now like to call on the city attorney to report on our closed session <laughs> items. Yes, good afternoon, Mayor Bruner, members of the city council. Uh, this afternoon, the city council convened at 1 p.m. by Zoom to discuss uh, two items. Item one was a conference with legal counsel involving significant exposure to litigation. Council received a report from legal counsel and gave direction on that item. Item two was a conference with legal counsel involving liability claims, claims of Brooke Elaine Murdoch and Rhonda Elaine Reyna. And those item, those claims are also listed this afternoon on your consent agenda as item number 13. There was no uh, reportable action closed session this afternoon. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, now I'd like to call on the city manager to provide uh, an update or if there are any updates or reports. Mayor, Council, good to be here this afternoon. Everybody see my screen? Yes. All right, very good. So a few quick updates to provide for you this afternoon. I wanted to start with a little bit of good news. While this bar chart might, might look scary, as we move to January, um, our local health officer and the state are now reporting uh, a decline in overall cases, um, largely attributable to the Omicron cases. Finally, um, moving down the, the back side of the bell curve. Uh, so th that's positive news, uh, particularly in light of the fact that January resulted in the, the highest case counts of since uh, the start of now almost three year long uh, pandemic. Um, in one to two weeks, uh, we're also projecting a, a more rapid decline in overall cases, hoping that uh, the, the impacts to, uh, to schools, as well as to many of our organizations start to subside as we move through the bulk of uh, the impacts from Omicron. Related to that, the state of California has also announced they are going to be uh, relaxing the indoor um, face mask mandate. I know that'll come as welcome news to many of us, uh, myself included, tells that we are moving into a more stable period um, of the pandemic. Also some good news on the on the um, treatment front. There are more therapeutic medications uh, that have arrived and are being dispersed through healthcare providers in addition to the traditional vaccines that we have had access to now for several months. All of that is adding to the tools that we have available to fight the virus, bolstering our, our efforts overall. I also wanted to share with the community that Depot Park testing location will need to relocate weeks so we're in the process of looking for a new testing site in the downtown area we'll of course share that information as a uh, final decision i'm going to pivot now to talking a little bit about some work that's been underway for the last several weeks uh, staff has been working with ad hoc of the city council focused around uh, revenue opportunities and specifically the possibility of bringing sales tax measure for the June or November ballot. So part of that work over the last couple of weeks, we've hired a pollster to complete a public research poll of likely voters. This work was really just aimed at getting a general sense of uh, the community's feelings around how the city is doing overall, um, our need for additional resources, um, areas of greatest concern or, or need, uh, challenges that we have in front of us to help inform uh, those decisions as, as we move to um, coming days and weeks. I thought I would share some of those top line results for council and communities benefit. Starting off, uh, this first slide shows uh, overall sentiment around uh, communities feelings about the job we're doing uh, as a city. So you can see here trends over time, this goes all the way back to uh, 1998, believe it or not, started conducting these polls. You can see the ebb and flow over time of how um, overall the community is feeling that we're doing an either excellent and or good job, um, range of services we offer. Um, a little bit of a bright spot, we actually saw an increase from the poll we conducted last year where we came in around 38%. Um, and for the 
this most recent one closed uh, just last week at about a 46% overall, I call it approval rating um, for, for providing. And I would point out, not not inconsistent polls that are conducted. When we asked the question of a need for more money, City of Santa Cruz, um, there are a number of questions generally talked about city's resources, whether or not there may be, may be a need for additional financial support. Um, a strong recognition that that was the case. 68% of the community stated that we had either great need or some need for additional resources uh, related to the services that we offer. We also um, asked a series of questions to get at um, what concerns our community has, uh, what issues that they seem to be very serious, um, or generally just problems for the community as a whole. Um, may come as no surprise that the item on the top of that list is the impact of homelessness on neighborhoods, parks, and open space. Um, related um, and uh, closely followed to that is the need for more housing and shelters for uh, homeless community members. Uh, following that was the high cost of living in Santa Cruz, a need for adequate water supply. You can see a number of other items that trickle down below that. I think it's important to note um, one of the encouraging trends on this list was that crime in Santa Cruz has been around 31%, um, significantly lower than some of the other items on this list, and I think reflective of um, progress on that front. Um, as of the so overall, that led to the um, question of where the community may fall with regards to supporting a potential sales tax measure. Um, we did see a, a drop in overall support from uh, both the initial votes uh, that were indicated um, in the, the 2021 poll from the numbers that were seen in the 2022 poll of about 9%. Um, so an overall drop, we attribute that to a number of things, uh, which partially related to the ongoing inflation and the impact it's having on, on folks' pocketbooks, as well as uh, indications that interest rates are going to be rising, as well as just the current uncertainty on the Omicron and the impact it's having on our, on our economy and families in a number of different ways. Um, it's important to note that a 59% overall approval is still a very strong um, indicator of support amongst the community for moving forward with the measure. And based on that feedback, we are planning on moving forward with bringing a question to the council on March, replacing a ballot on uh, a measure on the June ballot uh, for a sales tax increase. Uh, that work will really be aimed at aligning um, an expansion of revenue sources with the upcoming 22-23 budget process, as well as the council's strategic plan work that will be happening in the next couple of months. So I, I think the timing aligns really nicely and will ensure that as we're pursuing this opportunity that we're aligning it with what the community is telling us is most important as we work on expanding our, our homeless response capacity, as we work on downtown revitalization work, um, as we pursue opportunities for expanding housing and trying to um, put long-term solutions in place to the high cost of living in our, in our region. I want to talk a little bit about our homeless response efforts. Um, I think it's underscored in the poll that this is a high concern of the community, a uh, high concern for us as an organization as well. Uh, so over the last month, we were putting a lot of work into developing an integrated wide action plan for homeless response. We held a workshop last week, holding a second workshop tomorrow with all of our department heads, as well as our homeless response team, to really develop um, a solutions-oriented approach uh, to putting long-term um, solutions in place and ending homelessness. Uh, that'll be presented to the council and the community on March 8th. This work is really aimed at balancing individual support and community needs, as well as activating our values around health and safety, resource stewardship, economic vitality, collaboration, uh, as well as others. And this will be part of an ongoing effort going forward of providing a quarterly homeless response update to the 
council and the community uh, so both the council and um, our residents understand the work that's underway uh, budget decisions that are being made and really our overall um, approach um, trying to end, end the cycle cycle of homelessness in our community another big effort that's underway is our transition from at large to district election so we're in the process right now of collecting community feedback uh, maps Draft maps and a survey are now available on our website. You can see the address on the screen. Um, folks that are interested can also look at draft maps through in person locations, including City Hall, uh, the Downtown Library, and London Nelson Community Center. Um, we are also in the process now of putting together a community engagement effort that will allow other opportunities to provide input. Uh, keep an eye out for dates. That'll include some public forums as well as some coming council public hearings. Uh, so plenty of opportunity, and we look forward to hearing uh, thoughts and input. We have some really exciting um, affordable housing projects that are in the pipeline, uh, making their way to getting the shovel in the ground. And I wanted to highlight a couple that we're really excited about. Uh, the first being uh, the Pacific Station North. Uh, this project is be a, a vibrant mixed use uh, development that's going in at the existing uh, metro station, it's the former Greyhound station. And our um, big plug and shout out to our economic development for carrying a significant amount of funding uh, to help subsidize um, this project, um, really helping to bring this dream a reality. Uh, last week, we announced that $29 million in funding uh, was being provided by California. Uh, housing community development department for the 100 percent affordable pacific station north mixed use project uh, this project is expected to break break ground in 2023 and will provide 95 100 percent affordable one two and three bedroom so very exciting phase of this part of downtown we look forward to seeing this project um, get off the ground i wanted to talk a little bit also about the library mixed use project I know it's a, a project that's had a lot of interest and excitement in the community. Um, this project will provide a child care facility, as well as at least 100 to 125 units of very low income housing, uh, a public parking component that will include 310 spaces. That's actually a reduction from the original proposal of 400 uh, units. And um, in terms of the current phase of the project, we have schematic design drawings that are underway. Uh, community outreach is planned for late February and early March to collect input on uh, where, the, where the current design is headed. Uh, we've contracted with an arborist uh, to complete a report um, progress. And then discussions are underway to find a new permanent location for the farmer's market. We've had some really great uh, conversations with uh, the operators of our downtown market and are excited about finding a location where they can continue to thrive downtown for for many years to come. So uh, more information on that as the project moves along, but it's something that we uh, very much look forward to. I'd be happy to answer any questions that come up. Thank you. The manager, Matt Hufficker. Are there any council members with questions? Council Member Cummings. Um, well, thank you, Matt, for that very thorough and apparent report on uh, kind of where things are at in the city. Very much appreciated. Um, one question I had um, is, you know, with the numbers from Omicron going down, I know that we've been getting contacts more now. At least I have from people who are wanting to know when are we going to go back and being in person. I'm just kind of curious about um, if there's been any thought put into that and maybe discussion about going back to in-person. Yeah, yeah no, thanks for raising that question, Councilmember Cummings. That's a conversation that Mayor Bruner and I continue to have. Um, certainly interested in doing so if we can safely. I think with state relaxing the, the face mask mandate, I think we're getting closer to that point of being able to hold these meetings again. Um, I don't know whether that'll be as soon as February 22nd or not, but as soon as we make a decision on that, we'll be sure to get that out to uh, council on it. Thank you. 
that. Thank you. Um, next question I had, um, I want to express my appreciation around the revenue measure. Um, I just had one question slash concern that came up in the presentation, which is that um, given that we've seen the, um, and if you can maybe scroll down to the slide that showed the voting, like how the polling went, but um, I think that decrease in, in um, the, yeah, slide seven. Yeah, but um, seeing that increase from 70% to 61 and, and other, other uh, reductions in the support of the revenue measure, I'm wondering um, if we vote on this at the March meeting, is that going to give us enough time to be able to launch a strong campaign um, to be able to get support from the community? So that's just one concern I have since we're seeing kind of lower numbers. How do we ensure that we're going to? Yeah, uh, I think um, we're well positioned to do that. Council for Cummings, that that would be you know community wide effort. We can we can uh, advocate, excuse me, educate um, from a city standpoint. We're we're also expecting that there will be um, community members uh, willing and, and ready to help support that outreach effort as we move over the next few months. But we think there's ample time to do that uh, and make sure that um, our our community can make an Form decision is good. That's that would be our goal. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, next question is on home. I had pretty much one question for each of the different topics. Um, the next question with regards to the homeless response plan. First off, thank you very much because um, something that I was very frustrated with, and a lot of folks in the community were frustrated with, is just like we we're kind of haphazardly. You know, Creating different policies and programs without there being you know, a coordinated effort around what is the you know goal city and what is the actual plan that we're going to have around trying to address homelessness. So I very much appreciate that um, you know a month in you're you know tackling this in a way I think that's going to be um, well received by many members of our community. Um, the one question I do have is that there's been a lot of reports and a lot of you know outreach, the outreach that's been done over the years. And I'm just curious uh, how those previous uh, homelessness reports are being incorporated into the process. Right. Uh, so thanks for the question, Councilor Cummings. We are collecting uh, data from a lot of sources. There's a lot of great work that's happened already over the years to collect input from the community on the topic of homeless response. There's also some great work done at the regional level that we were a part of, as well as the other jurisdictions throughout the county to inform the, the countywide homeless response plan. Um, and we've got some great uh, experience from our own team that are on the ground every day providing services to our homeless community. So we're collecting information from all those sources to help inform the action plan uh, that we're bringing forward and doing it in an intentional way that we think will uh, align nicely with the regional work we're partnering on with the county um, and other jurisdictions uh, in our region. Great. And then um, follow up is that in that plan, um, are you going to expect to see like numbers around like staffing and budgeting, or is this kind of just going to be a general description of what that plan is? Yeah, we want this to be a tangible action. I would, you know, I would differentiate it from a plan you're going to see. Um, specific, measurable actions we can take, and we, best we can, are going to have some price tags attached, attached to that work as well, so that the council can understand what we need from a resource standpoint to be able to move this work forward. Um, and some of that, of course, will include um, staffing capacity, sure that we, from an organizational standpoint, we have uh, the resources we need to work forward. But that'll all be part of the, part of the I don't want to labor this topic because we can talk for hours through homelessness. Um, I will just, I guess I'll just make a comment then rather than ask it a formal question. But um, actually, no, I'm going to have to ask this as a question. When this plan comes to council, will we have, will this be a kind of like an opportunity for people to provide input and then it will take that input and kind of bring back the final plan? Or is the expectation that this will be a final plan? Or this is trying to get, get a sense because I know that. There's a lot of discussion in the community on what we'd like to see. And um, I feel like if it comes and it's like, this is the plan, and people 
feel like they haven't had a chance to have their input incorporated, then they might be a little frustrated. Just wondering kind of what that process is around how this plan goes forward. Okay, so there's there's a couple of things I would say to that. Uh, we're going to be meeting with each of you individually uh, in advance of the council meeting to collect input from you as well as input you're receiving from community members. I think that's important. We also have some very time sensitive work we need to do. So we our hope was to bring the plan as uh, close to final to bring it on the eighth. But of course, that will also be part of um, a public dialogue, and we would welcome members that have interest in the topic to join the meeting, share their thoughts. And where there's opportunity, of course, you know, we'll be open to incorporating that back in the Great. Um, one comment is that I'll make and, and thank you for, for um inspiring that helpful. Um comment on the library project. Um one thing that I've heard discussions with community members when they there was the mention of the green roof. Um I think um, one thing I mentioned at the last council meeting was, you know, have access. What I've been hearing in the community is some people have even mentioned that the green roof could be a space for people who live in the housing to have gardens um, for growing food, vegetables. So, you know, having a opportunity for people to actually use that space for providing. Um, so, just thought I'd maybe add that as a, as a suggestion, um, since there's a lot of meetings with. with like that to see if that can um, and then my final question is related to the district maps um, since you brought that item up because we also had informational item in our binder um, related to the committee uh, that was formed back in late November <clears throat> and I know that there's been discussion around um, creation of potentially a six six districts to directly elect the mayor and that's kind of what there's some back and forth within the, the memo about um, you know, the possibility of that. And given that the group was charged with you know, bringing back um, uh, process, if that's going to be the case, I'm just wondering where that's at and, you know, what are we expecting to kind of come out of this? Because if we are going to move in that direction of a six district and a direct elected mayor, it seems like that process needs to kind of happen pretty soon. And so I'm just curious, and it needs, obviously needs to come to council for approval. So I'm kind of wondering, based on the memo we received and what you had mentioned earlier about district plan, kind of where that's at. Yeah, you're asking a million dollar question. Um, we actually just met with the subcommittee just before today's meeting to give additional direction uh, with regards to what options we have going forward. And based on the subcommittee's direction, Will likely be moving forward with bringing the option to the full council uh, in the near future. We don't have that date certain yet, but it does need to happen quickly. To your point, Councilmember Cummings, we are on a schedule. So we are working towards that uh, with the goal of bringing something uh, to the council for a full discussion as soon as possible. And as soon as we have more information on that, uh, we will be sure to share that uh, with the community as well as the council. Conversation we just had this afternoon. I'm cut off the press, but that's the direction of it. Um, I just like, I guess, end by recommending that if we are to go in that direction, that we have some kind of public process for getting input. Since I mean, even with this, you know, going to the district question, seven districts, um, you know, there's a lot of process. I spoke with some of the people who went to those earlier meetings, and I think there's only been, you know, we were told to recommend some people who could sit in on some meetings for the redistricting group and they I think only had one meeting to my knowledge. Um so if there can be a we're gonna move in that direction, I think having a process a timeline for how we can get community input on what they would like to do um, would be really helpful if we're gonna and we're we're committed to doing that. So I appreciate that comment and we'll continue to ensure that it's open and transparent as long as Thank you, Council Member Cummings. Uh, we are taking questions on the city manager's report, Council Member Myers, and then Member. Two quick questions. Um, Matt, is this um, 
PowerPoint available? It will be published with the packet, or is there a way that available some of the findings holding my interest in us or? We can probably do all of the above. Uh, okay. Councilmember Myers, so I'll talk with Bonnie about that. Attach it to the packet on our website, and you all on top of it. I was just curious about the uptick. Um, there was some kind of a low low periods there for a couple of years. Is there anything in the poll that the, that the pollster was able to sort of point to in terms of that uptick with sort of overall um, people feeling like the city was on the right track, or you know that by about about four. Curious to tease out why people are going on. <laughs> why in the world would they feel that? No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to unpack there. Um, you know, a lot of it has to do, including going all the way back to the late 90s, kind of fluctuations with the economy. It's a major indicator about how people are feeling about where things are going based on. Um, you know, their own personal experience and where the economy is headed. So that has something to do with it. I also think, you know, at the time we're conducting the poll, there has been a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel when it comes to Omicron, which is starting to see the impacts of it waning a bit. Um, that, that has had some influence over it. Um, I'd like to think too, that some of the information we put out publicly around putting together a comprehensive approach around homelessness, uh, developing some intentional strategic work around that, um, helping around public perception, but um, hard to say. You know, it's, we're, we're happy to have a little bit of a positive uptick. Now it's an opportunity for us to try to keep that uh, momentum. Great, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Council Member Brown? Just a quick follow-up question to Council Member Cummings. Uh, that later question related to the, the collection process, because I, I think it, I, I just want to make sure it's clear for the public. I, I'm pretty clear about this, but um, I didn't hear it come out uh, uh, back and forth here, and it, it wasn't sort of clear in the memo that we received. Um, so the public knows, the in terms of the process for um, doing anything beyond um, what has been called this safe harbor move as part of our negotiations to avoid a lawsuit over district elections, um, to move to seven districts. Other changes, so if we were to consider uh, six districts with an at-large mayor would require a vote of um, So we are not in a position to make that decision ourselves, is that correct? That's um, right. So the council can establish a seven district structure by an ordinance. Not inconsistent with the order lays out, but elections to establish an independent at large elected mayor is incongruous with how the charter speaks to the process and would require a charter amendment, which requires a vote. Thank you for that clarification. Um, and then, so given that, is the discussion at this point um, contemplating? Putting something on the June ballot because again that would have to happen pretty quickly and um, I personally feel pretty uncomfortable uh, voting to put that before the voters with you know, potentially a two month turnaround without um, real engagement on that piece um, and I I just wanted to remind everybody that when this was established back in November there was a recommendations about a process. Um, beyond uh, recommendations that they take a, take a particular action. So I wanted to want to right. put that out there and ask where you're where the steps at. So I don't want to get too far down the road on this because we don't have this item agendized today. But I, I will just say yes, that is what's being contemplated. Yes, it will have to move fast, and you will have an opportunity to express your thoughts on it, Councilor Brown, as well as the rest of the council. But that is what is. Thank you. Um, that's clear for the viewing public as well. 
Thank you, Council Member Brown. Are there any other questions for City Manager Update Part? Okay, let's move on to item five. The City Council will review the meeting calendar attached to the agenda. And I'll now call on City Clerk to provide any updates to the calendar. There are no updates. None. Now is the consent agenda first up, items six through 18 on our agenda. For members of the public who are streaming, now is the time to call in. If you would like to comment on items six through 18, again, the agenda with those items is on our city website, cityofsantacruz.com. If you'd like to uh, call and press star nine to raise your hand and listen for the cue saying you have been unmuted. Please remember to mute your streaming device and press star nine to raise your hand. All items will be acted upon in one motion unless an item is pulled by a council member for further discussion. Are there any council members who wish to comment on or pull any items before we continue? Okay, we have some hands. Council member Cummings. We pull item number nine, and I have a question for item number nine. Question, okay, pull nine, question for 15. Council member Myers. Just have a comment on uh, item 14. Comment 13. Yeah. Council member Brown. So I also uh, wanted to pull nine, and I have a question on. So I'll raise those. Okay. Council member Myers. Okay, so I will begin with the uh, comment on question number 14 and 14. Item number 14. Uh, I saw council member Conklin. Thank you. I just saw that too. <laughs> council member Cullen Terry Johnson. Thank you. Thanks for bringing um, that to the mayor's attention, council member Cummings. I also just wanted to comment on 14. Okay. She comments on 14. Item number 14 is Housing Matters Hygiene Bay Remodel Project Authorization to Advertise and Award Item from Public Works Department. And so, Council Member Myers and then Council Member Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to um, thank our staff um, and also the I know that both our team and Housing Matters, I should not miss Housing Matters, they are key to this. Um, I know during the two by two last year, there was a lot of discussion about how to get this facility back up again. It's full infrastructure for those experiencing our community. And um, I know that um, there was a lot of effort put in partnership to try to get heard away and away. So I just wanna again thank our homeless team, homeless resource team that has been working on this. Um, also express my thanks to also matters. Structure back up. Oh, Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Council Member Colin Terry Johnson. Thank you, Mary. I'll echo those sentiments. Also, want to just um, acknowledge and thank all the work that's gone into making this happen. I know it's been uh, a little while that we've been waiting for this. Um, and I want to acknowledge and thank Housing Matters for all the amazing work that they do. Uh, this is going to be critical for the services that they provide to our most vulnerable in our community. So thanks for everyone's work on it. Thank you, Council Member Colin Terry Johnson. Okay, uh, let's see, we'll move on to the questions on item number 15. Item number 15 was the purchase of two refuse trucks, also Public Works Department 
uh, council member coming. Thank you, Mary. I just wanted to um, bring this up because I know in the past um, there's been a lot of interest and I think it's been well received by the city in purchasing electric um, wage trucks, refuge trucks, I should say. And I'm just wondering, I know that we bought one that's electric currently. Um, and I do understand that these are kind of in their early phases of development. I'm just wondering if um, the public works director can just comment on kind of where we're headed in terms of transitioning our fleet and the need for these uh, current, these two trucks at this point. Sure, thank you, Councilmember Cummings. That's a great question. Um, as we stated in the report, um, Oh, we, we have purchased uh, one truck that should be here in April. Um, we just received a grant for a second truck. We're, not, um, we're just finalizing that right now, the grant. Um, the, the one item we have that's before you are not um, electric at this point, but our focus is on getting the infrastructure in place so that we can charge these vehicles when they get here, and that's critical. Um, so that's where that effort going. Uh, we're working with PG&E to increase the size of our transformers and uh, the service that we can provide these heavy duty vehicles. Uh, we met with the finance director today talking about a grant for an electric dump truck, also an electric, um, just the heavy duty truck. So we are continuing to move in that direction. Um, as, as these projects come forward, as we can get grants for these vehicles they are still you know not you can't just go to the store and order one and, and have them delivered so um a lot of them are special built we are working through it to learn how they work get the infrastructure in place so we are definitely focused on electrifying our fleet as soon as we can practically okay. appreciate that um yeah. i think it's helpful to know you know we're the city is doing everything it can to kind of you know, build infrastructure that we can so that we can then you know, have electric fleets, and we're also you know, wanting to test things out before diving head first. The last thing we want to do is purchase these trucks and have them not meet our needs. So, really appreciate that update on letting us know that that electric truck is coming, and we'll be looking forward to hearing more about how um, how it works with our city. Um, Great. Next question I had to do was um, I know we're we have some mandates, state mandates around organic waste. Um, pick up. I'm just wondering with the purchase of these two new refuse trucks, um, how are they going to be? Are how will they be outfitted to help us meet those demands around um, the collection, the new collection of organic waste that we're going to be? Right. Um, these are replacement trucks for our existing fleet. Um, we are working on a, a separate route for our organic pickup. We've ordered our containers, uh, they're six yard containers, and they'll be rolling them out as they come in. Um, and we'll work it out in phases throughout the city so that we can work with neighborhoods so they they get this equipment and they know how to use it, an effective program. We'll actually have a separate route, uh, two trucks that will, deliver, that will service the whole city for organic waste, and we'll add to those routes as we need to, but I think we uh, with the rollout, be fine, and we'll have our existing fleet uh, be able to operate with that. So, great. Those are all the questions I have on that item. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Council Member Cumming. Council Member Brown. Mayor, uh, well, Council Member Cummings asked, uh, started the ball rolling on the questions that I, um, as you could imagine, uh, will, would be asking. Um, Settle. Uh, I have two follow-ups. Um, the one is related to this question around charging capacity. I think it's um, I think it's important for uh, all of us and the public to understand what that entails. Um, we're not talking about like at your home putting in a charging station that where you can charge your personal vehicle, and that seems like a pretty a relative. If you have the resources, is a relatively straightforward thing. Um, and so this lengthy process to um, get the charging capacity that we need to really transition to uh, the, our fleet is definitely takes longer, it takes more resources. Can you give us a sense of um, kind of what 
how long you anticipate that's going to take, if there are roadblocks, if there are other things that, you know, I mean, we can't control PG&E. Um, right. But I, and thank you for having those conversations. But, you know, anything that we needs to happen that, um, so we can make this happen as, you know, as quickly um, as possible, kind of the, the landscape for that. And then my second question is, um, and I, again, I think it's important for folks to know um, what's going on. Uh, why can't we uh, hold on to those draft trucks for a little bit longer? Uh, in order, I know they're on a cycle, but could they run longer so that we could um, perhaps see if the technology catches up? There? Yeah, those are great questions. Um, we let me answer the second one first. Um, we budget our refuse trucks. They're paid to be in our rates. They're paid off in year five them to year seven so we get two years of use out of them that they're already paid off by that time they've they've done over a million stops and they are um ready to be replaced they're worn out so it, it's not economically feasible as far as maintenance compared to um continuing to keep them going um if if we do have a truck that still has good life in it we're not going to change it out we'll change that one that we're having problems so we do we do monitor that and operate that way. Um, as far as um, the infrastructure that's required, you're right. We need a, a major coming into the courtyard. That's where we have over 30 refuse trucks. Think about um, each one of these trucks needs a very large um, amount of electricity to a transformer to be able to charge those trucks, and we have to be able to charge them overnight. Um, and so we're we're starting slowly. We also ordered a, a mobile charger in case the vehicle cannot make it through the route and we have to go in and, and boost that, that vehicle to get it back to the yard so we can get an overnight charge. Um, so we'll have a series of quick chargers and trickle chargers that'll work overnight to get the vehicle going. Uh, as far as timing, that's a good question. We don't fully control it. We don't have the full power in the yard. So there, that's the bottleneck that we're looking at. We've ordered our equipment. That the, um, that's the unknown part of the schedule is when when does it all hit, get hooked up? Uh, the other thing is we just submitted a grant to 3CE to do a strategic plan for our other facilities on what we need for electric charging um, so that we can fully electrify our fleet. So we are planning ahead, not just Yard, we're looking at the park yard. We're going to look at other city facilities where we need to charge these heavy vehicles. So um, we are we are thinking forward so that we can be ready when the when the vehicles and the economic makes sense for us to do that. We're also looking at our rate study that will be coming to you probably in the next year, factoring in how fast we hurt these fleets and what that will do to our rates. So um, there's an economic cost. To provide and you, you'll we'll bring that forward as we look at a rate. Thank you. That's really helpful. I I appreciate going a little bit into the weeds. I think it's important to understand the complexity of this and get a little more info. So we really appreciate. It. Oh, you're welcome. Council Member Golder, did you have a question on I, item? I have 15? a comment. I, is a comment on this? Is that okay? Yes. Okay, so just just listening to my colleagues, and while I appreciate um, your ambitious, um, you know, ideas, I just want to remind everybody that, you know, according to uh, California Energy Commission, the state of California, we're only getting about a third of our energy is renewable at this point, and so moving towards electrification, while I support it in theory, I feel like we're doing a little bit of greenwashing where we're using coal or you know, natural gas to make the electricity. And I want to be mindful that these refuse trucks and fire trucks and other city fleet vehicles that are essential to, you know, keeping our city safe and clean. If we if we have um, power outages, I want to make sure that we have appropriate infrastructure in place to keep these vehicles running, keep our, you know, cities, like, safe. And so I agree, but I don't think we should try and pick out the forefront here in this case, I think we should wait until the technology catches up and um, be fiscally responsible at this point. That's where I am. 
Thank you, Council Member Cooper. Okay, thank you, uh, Department Director Mark Gettle, Public Works. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs> If there are any members of the public that would like to speak to any item on our consent agenda, with the exception of item number nine, which was pulled, item number nine, resolutions amending council policy, city council meetings, oral communications, and council member handbook. So with the exception of that item, if there are any members of the public that would like to speak, now is the time to do so. Please press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set for two minutes. If there are attendees, have one hand raised, I, I am watching you. Yeah, thank you. As to item six, it's time to end support for COVID mandates. Only the Karen fascists and those who think government is always the solution when in fact it is a corrupt elitist power monger, bigger problem, aren't uh, ready to accept that Omicron is more the flu that vaccines don't protect against that they can live without it while insisting outpatient treatments finally should become a priority, that the government's ill-considered ignorant response mandates didn't stop COVID and also are still ruining and costing many lives or fortunes, that the corruption and ignorance of the government needs examination uh, for lessons learned, uh, and heads need a role in starting with Fauci. Uh, join England, Norway, Denmark, Sweden, Switzerland, Finland, Ireland, and Saskatchewan, who now choose reason freedom unlike the fascist old guard, Germany, Austria, and Italy. The window to back away from all mandates before mass protests and mass civil disobedience is closing. The item 11 socialist cannabis welfare draft ordinance should absolutely be pulled for public discussion. There is insufficient time to discuss here, but it's another example of lazy politicians letting unelected bureaucrats fashion every defective West idea into ordinance law without question for rubber stamp approval in what amounts to a highly discriminatory city takeover of the cannabis industry. As to item eight, I'd remind you every single member of the public that has ever spoken on the subject has said two minutes speaking time was insufficient. Many are routinely cut off, others are allowed to inconsistently continue. You should try three minutes as the practice as the public has repeatedly requested and experienced more public input. Public comment is now minimal to non-existent, but if and when a firm count of speakers indicates too many for 30 minutes, then time can be shortened. Free shortened time or group banning by a mayor or on a regular business basis when no such need or good reason actually arose tells me you don't want to hear from the public at all when reality is it's hubris to think seven gray matters are superior to the collective wisdom of the many. You need all the diverse opinion you can get. Bracketing a time certain for oral communications uh, may isolate it from the meeting. Break time policy is not needed. Take a break when you want. Thanks. Thank you. I am watching you for calling in. I don't see any other attendees. I will now bring it back and I am looking for a motion on the remaining items of the consent agenda. Items six through 18, with the exception of item nine that was pulled by Council Member Cummings and Council Member Brown. And the it back, Council Member or Vice Mayor uh, Martin Watt. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'm happy to move the consent agenda um, item except with the exception of item number nine. And uh, Council Member Cummings. Second. The motion by Vice Mayor Watkins is seconded by Council Member Cummings. And I'd like to ask the clerk to take a roll call vote. Um, there is one more hand that we have on that or Okay, uh, we can go back before we vote. 
I'm sorry if I missed that hand. Um, I do see a, another hand raised. Looks like LR are the initials. Yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes, welcome. Oh, thank you. You ready? Go ahead. Commenting on item 13, my name is Leonie Reyna. I am the aunt of Brooke Murdoch and a recently retired police sergeant with extensive experience. I have video of what SDPD did to my niece and it is extremely horrific and disturbing. Brooke was only 13 years old and the alleged victim of a parental kidnapping. Although council is voting to reject the claim, I hope you all take the time to watch the video and ask yourself if this is how you want your daughter's story. Brooke did nothing wrong. She did not commit a crime or any infraction. She was a victim. So I cannot understand why Santa Cruz used any force on her, let alone the exorbitant force used to include standing on metal handcuffs attached to the child's ankles as she screamed out in pain. Ms. Mayor, please follow up with the independent police auditor and chief of police to ensure this does not happen to any other child. Thank you. Thank you for your public comment, LR. I will now bring it back to um, council. And we do have a motion on the floor. We have a motion by Vice Mayor Watt, second by Cummings for consent agenda item six through 18 with the exception of item nine. And I'd like to ask the clerk to please do a roll call vote. First, Dawn Perry Johnson. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. We will now come back to uh, consent agenda item number nine. That is resolutions amending council policy 6.6, .6, city council meetings, oral communications, and council member handbook. And uh, this is the city attorney's office item and I will uh, council member Cummings. Mayor, um you know what this is actually similar to what the caller mentioned um, during public comment, which was that um, many boards that I've sat on and which joined the council have had um, three minutes to be a lot of time for public public comment. And our policy currently allows for the mayor to have discretion over increasing or reducing that time. Um, but as a standard, you know, having three minutes as the policy, I think would be good, especially when we have items on our agenda where there's not they're gonna be present. Um, to the caller's point, we wanna to try to make uh, government accessible to people in our community. We wanna give them an opportunity to be heard. And while there are times when we need to reduce that time, it sometimes is like one minute or less because hundreds of people want to address us. When um, you know when we're setting standards of how we want the community to be able to approach government, we try to provide them with a fair amount of time for them to be So um, my what I was hoping that we could do, um, and when there's time for a motion, I'm happy to make a motion. But um, just leaving in the in policy. Um, Point number four, um, just leaving that at three minutes and then uh, moving forward with the other recommend, recommended. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Brown. Mayor, uh, yeah, I would just echo the comments made by Cummings. Um, and I, I'll acknowledge a rare day that I am in agreement with our public speaker on issues. Um, and so I just want to put that out there. Um, but I think right that um, that we do have a responsibility to the public and that we 
um, you know, efforts to, to scale that to, um, I think, cause people in the community to wonder uh, the extent to which we are really interested in being public. But I recognize there are other ways for that input to occur. I also recognize that it is the um, prerogative of the chair of our meetings uh, to limit time under three minutes uh, per speaker uh, when the occasion calls for it. I do that myself as chair of the RTP, um, but I think that the three minute guideline, which is standard across many, many, many public agencies, um, is uh, worth maintaining. And um, I, I understand the reasons for the, the change in the policy uh, related to the timing of oral communications. It is a logistical challenge, always. Uh, we don't know how long meetings are going to take or individual items, so support that. But I would like to um, maintain at least the possibility of minute public comment uh, on items. Again, prerogative of the mayor. Uh, is, so thank you, Councilmember Brown. This is an item, and just for the public, if you don't have this agenda, um, the current policy designates a 7 o'clock p.m. start time for oral communications and amending the policy by a time certain based on each agenda is part of the discussion, as well as the current policy designates a three-minute speaking period for individuals during oral communications. And the current practice uh, has been to allow three minutes uh, and amending the policy to reflect a two minute speaking time to align the policy with current practice. However, the mayor would still have discretion to increase or decrease the allotted time for oral communication. So at this point, um, is there a motion, uh, an amendment to the motion that would like to be made? Um, something off the policy. Yes. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. And at this point, we will bring it out to the public for public comment. Anybody in the public who would like to speak to item number nine on the consent agenda, now is your time. Press star nine to raise your hand. I see one attendee with their hand raised. Brian, trail now. Hi, everyone. This is Brian Trail now. Uh, you know, I've been uh, participating in transportation policy for over 20 years with Santa Cruz and actually um, attended uh, the RTC meetings for the last 10 years. And I'll tell you, <laughs> the Zoom is really beautiful, isn't it, you guys? Um, and so just a comment on the two minute, three minute. Yeah, you know, I, I have found that Two minutes is starting to work, um, and you know everybody's time is very precious. And I'm finding that the two minutes, I I I, I found it to be a little rushy, but at the end of the day, I think we can all fully communicate our point in two minutes. So that's just my experience right now. The Zoom, and so that's my two cents. I appreciate all the work you all doing. Thank you. Thank you so much for your public comment. And we have another caller. I am watching you. Yeah, I guess I got confused on the numbers there before, but uh, I don't have too much to add except really, uh, you know, two minutes. I, like when I, I write a lot of speeches and, and deliver them, and I write single page, you know, 14 point huge type. And you know what? Nobody can read that in two minutes. And it, it would be blazing fast, and you wouldn't even understand a word they said. And so, you know, that's not much to ask. A single page, uh, you know, takes two and a half minutes probably, uh, spoken in a, in a way that people could actually understand and listen to. Uh, and it, virtually every speaker runs out of time normally, and they have a few more sentences. I, I think that uh, the idea that two minutes works is, Really just wrong. Sorry to say. Thank you for your public comment. 
Are there any other attendees that would like to comment, comment item nine on the consent agenda? Okay. I will bring it back to council. And I see Vice Mayor Mark Watkin. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, my, I actually kind of have like a, a clarifying question. My understanding, if and maybe this is for you, Tony, is that, you know, and, and also my recollection of prior mayors for as long as I've been on the council, that the two minutes has been sort of the consistent amount of time. But uh, there have been nights or evenings of interest where there's numerous people for oral communications and that has been decreased in order for everybody to speak or others where uh, there is additional time allotted. So I, I don't, um, so it, that discretion will still exist even though it's sort of acknowledging the two minutes as sort of the average time, correct? That's right. Um, the, the two minutes has been, <clears throat> Uh, the standard, or not the standard, but the practice for uh, well over, probably close to two years or so. Um, and really, it's just policy matter for the council, but under the existing policy, as well as um, what's proposed here, the mayor would have the discretion to either increase or decrease the amount of time allotted. Um, okay, I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, I think for me, I think that you know, one of the things that we can remember as the community uh, is just to reach out to our, your council members to reach out to us, the email or phone or otherwise to help us understand the need that you have that you want us to be aware of, that you could speak to us at oral communications. And I think with technology and access to email and um, other forms of communication, oral communications has shifted over the years uh, in terms of what it's in the past. So um, I just want to state that Please do uh, contact us so we can know your, your issues and um, be able to address them in more time. And for the purposes of meeting management, knowing that we've had some very, very long meetings, I think, and for transparency with the community, I think, you know, unless it's the, the mayor's um, interest in wanting to move it to three, I think the two makes a lot of sense to me personally, and that if the mayor wants to increase it to three or decrease it, giving given the, you know, the community input, that feels comfortable to me in terms of practice. So I guess I'm just, I'm not necessarily sure if the three minutes is is, um, is the direction to go, unless that's something that the mayor wants to do at this time. I guess. That's sort of how I feel about it. Thank you, uh, Vice Mayor Watkins. Uh, and, you know, I'll bring it to Council Member Cummings and then I'll I was going to make a motion to move item nine with the exception of paying this for. Second. We have a motion by Council Member Cummings <clears throat> and a second by Council Member Brown. Uh, can I, can I ask for clarification on that? Yeah, yeah item nine with. You said something about number four? And yes, I can clarify. In the policy statement, so the attached council policy six, page 926, the changes that are highlighted in red are on numbers one, two, and four. And so the motion is to, to um, move the recommendations with the exception to the changes that were made to item number four, which is no individual will be allowed to more than three. So just for clarity, um, I, I just want to remind the council there are two resolutions in front of you, one amending policy 6.6, .6, the second one amending the handbook. I think the motion can be stated that uh, the, the recommendation is to adopt the resolutions, uh, but in both the handbook and the policy retain the time limit of three minutes as opposed to two minutes. Uh, did City Clerk Bonnie Bush get that? I did. I was. Did you have your hand up? Yeah, I was going to make the same. Okay, the thank you. Proposal. Okay, thank you. Uh, so, is there any discussion? Further discussion on this item? 
Spirit of Hope. Um, I would like to yeah, say. Yeah. I was just wondering if you wanted to share on it as the sort of yeah. the person who's. I just, I, and I think, you know, these are all valid points that have been brought up. And um, I didn't, I wasn't aware of the minute policy. Uh, my experience has been the two minutes. And um, given that uh, we receive a lot of communication outside of oral communications um, via phone and email and in person, um, and in, in, in the spirit of meeting management and time management, having the opportunity to increase or decrease regardless, it made sense to kind of align what, what practice has been. So I'm happy either way because ultimately um, the discretion is with the chair, the mayor. And, um, you know, if it, if it sounds a little more accessible to the community, then I'm happy um, to align with the motion that was made on the floor, um, knowing that there is discretion to uh, reduce the time as need be with certain items, certain agendas. <laughs> Is there any other further discussion on this item? Okay. I, uh, I'd like to ask the clerk to take a roll call vote. Commissioner Johnson. Aye. 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 Brown. Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. Okay. I believe that concludes our consent agenda. Next up on our agenda is item number 19. This is a public hearing. It's the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2022-01, repealing chapter 16.03, plumbing fixture retrofit regulations of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. And let's see, item number 19 is the water department. And Rosemary Monard, water department director, is present. Is there any presentation? No, we briefed this at the last meeting, so this is the second reading, and I guess if there's no comments, then we can move to a motion. Great. Thank you so much. And no emails were received by the city council at cityofsantacruz.com uh, email address as well. Uh, so I will call on council member Myers. I'll go ahead and move the item, second reading and final adoption of ordinance number to adopt. I'll move the, to move, to adopt ordinance number 2022-01, chapter 16.03, plumbing fixture 
present regulation. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Seconded by Brown. If you are interested in commenting on the second reading and final adoption of ordinance number 2022-01, repealing chapter 16.03, plumbing fixture retrofit regulations of the Santa Cruz Municipal Code, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, the time we will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will be set to minutes. I don't see any attendees with their hands raised. Bringing it back to council, we have a motion on the floor by Myers, seconded by Brown. I'd like to ask her to do a roll call vote. Member Kellenberry Johnson. Aye. 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 Mayor Watkins. <coughs> Aye. Mayor Brown. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. At this point, I'd like to call a short break, 15 minute break before we move on to the next item, general business item number 20. So we will return at 3, uh, 3.50. Thank you.
Okay, we will now continue with our agenda today. Returning a short break. And next up on our agenda, let's make sure everybody's ready here. Next up on our agenda is item 20. Opposition to the potential adverse abandonment actions for heavy freight rail service on the Felton Branch Line and Santa Cruz Branch Line. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if this is an item you would like to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by the council members who brought forward followed by questions from the council. We will then take public comment and return to council for a deliberation and action. I'd like to <laughs> introduce Sandy Brown, council member Brown, who is our representative on the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission, as well as Guy Preston, who is here with us as the director of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation Commission. And so I'd like to hand it off uh, to uh, Council Member Brown to start us off, and then Council Member Cummings, and um, myself, and then uh, Guy Preston. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, so I'll be brief with my remarks is an item that uh, came up for uh, the, the RTC at our last meeting, and we had an informational item uh, to talk about the possibilities of adverse abandonment as a piece of the uh, puzzle of uh, what we're going to be doing <laughs> with our, um, our rail line, our rail right of way, and um, I'm gonna let uh, Director Preston provide uh, the information that is really helpful for the uh, council and for the public. And um, so I, I don't want to get too far into this, but it, it did come up in response to significant community concern. Um, as uh, the, an RTC member and the RTC representative for the city, um, I received um, over 6,000 messages uh, in response to this item being uh, discussed at the RT, and um, I think that uh, while we did not take action, um, we heard a lot from the community uh, about those concerns, and I wanted to uh, provide an opportunity for the city council to also weigh in. Um, in conversations prior to this meeting uh, about this item, uh, I did speak, and as did other members of the committee, I'll turn it over to them in just a moment, or the, the um, signers on the agenda item, not the committee, uh, uh, did talk with our city manager who uh, thought it use, felt useful to have uh, sort of a rail banking 101 uh, from and, and kind of context uh, and issues related to this item uh, for for the council uh, members who are not as immersed in these. So I'll, I'll just leave it there. Um, I do have um, some other thoughts, but I want to give uh, my colleagues an opportunity to speak up and then uh, direct the question and do all the uh, an opportunity to have questions, ask questions. So um, thank you for uh, putting this on the agenda. I'm looking forward to hearing from you all. Thank you, Council Member Brown. Council Member Cummings. Thank you, Mayor. Um, and um, thank you, members of the public, for joining us. Thank you, Guy Preston, for being here as well. Um, when I, when it became clear that there was going to be an item on the RTC, the Regional Transportation Commission's agenda on February 3rd, related to uh, adverse abandonment actions for heavy freight rail, um, it wasn't clear whether or not it was going to be an informational item or whether action was going to be taken. Um, as a result, many members of the public reached out to me and were very concerned about the direction that the commission was taking and the potential for action to be taken. And they urged me to 
actually bring forward an emergency item at our last city council meeting um, because many members of the public really wanted the city of Santa Cruz and the city council to take a stance on this item and to have the city weigh in on the decision at Park City. Ultimately, the Transportation Commission only had an informational item. And to Council Members Brown point, there were over 6,000 letters sent to the commissioners. And I had received feedback from a number of commissioners about how much uh, feedback they've been receiving, uh, the majority of which was opposition to the abandonment action. <clears throat> um, subsequently, we were able to have an opportunity for this to go on our agenda for members of the public to be able to um, have time to see our agenda report. And I've still had members of the public expressing that they really want to see us take some kind of action, even regardless of whether or not um, something a deal will be worked out between RTC or in camp, um, regardless of whether or not this won't come back to the RTC. Um, many members of the public have expressed that they want to make sure that the city is on record, especially because for years, the city of Santa Cruz has been very supportive of rail and trail. It's something we have unanimously voted in support of. And at this point, we're seeing um, the potential for an action taken that would not only hurt uh, a, lo a local business that brings in revenue to our city, um, but also um, the potential for future rail. And, it would, and we've also received um, a letter that has been signed on by many of the fire, the fire departments in, um, in the area of concern. And they've all expressed that the freight can be used to fight fires. And if we move forward with this abandonment, that that would significantly <laughs> impact the ability for um, fire to use those rail lines in the event of an emergency. And so um, I'll stop, I'll leave my comments there. Um, and I just want to thank um, Council Member Brown, uh, Mayor Bruner, for putting this on and for help, and this, helping to bring forward. Sorry, going to tie a little. And um, with that, I will yield my time. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Cummings. And um, thank you, uh, Director Preston. Um, this was an item that I received a lot of. Um, inquiries about and uh, written communications, uh, several emails and concerned situ uh, constituent. And um, I think even though we have a representative of the city on the commission, the, the RTC, the Regional Transportation Commission, um, there is an opportunity here for the council to discuss a stronger uh, stance um, the council supporting um, the opposition of uh, the person of this item. So I appreciate your time to, to share information and to give us your report. Thank you, Mayor Bruner and fellow city council members for having me here today. I appreciate the opportunity to discuss some of the challenges that our he has been facing on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line and how the discussion developing potential adverse abandonment act great rail service on the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line and Mountain Branch Rail Line. RTC is very interested in that. Before we get there, I want to emphasize that over the past year, RTC has had several discussions on the best use of the corridor and how best to preserve the rail right away. Although RTC desires to ultimately use Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line for commuter rail between Pajaro Junction and Santa Cruz, and a trail reaching the entire length of Davenport, the line is currently only used for freight rail in Watsonville. Roaring Camp has been using a portion of the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line for their iconic beach train running to the Santa Cruz Ford Line. The Fountain Line is separate from the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line, but the two lines connect on Chestnut Street at about the intersection of Maple Street to downtown Santa Cruz. Roaring Camp uses a short portion of the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line to reach the boardwalk. They use, also use the Y, located between the wharf and Hill Park from their trains. And RTC is very supportive of that long. Both the Felton Branch Line and the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line are part of the federal freight network. Today's discussion will have 
a heavy emphasis on these mines used for heavy freight rail service. Santa Cruz Big Trees Railway, owned by Roaring Camp, designated common carrier freight, belt and branch line with the obligation to provide freight service on reasonable demand. RTC contracts its freight obligation, St. Paul and Pacific Railway on the Santa Cruz. There hasn't been any freight on either line beyond Watsonville since at least 2017. No major freight through Santa Cruz since the CMEX plant closed in 2010. As I explained to my commission last week, Roaring Camp will be affected by whatever RTC does, doesn't Santa Cruz Trans Rail Line. I also realized that since both railways travel through city limits, the city will also be affected. Therefore, I look forward to hearing your input regarding the city's priorities regarding the rail. In the summer of 2020, RTC's freight operators on Pacific Railway provided notices of intent to terminate RTC's freight license agreement with them and file for abandonment of freight rail in the Santa Cruz Trans Rail Line. Yeah, potential abandonment, abandonment caught RTC's attention. Due to these notices, the commission has been considering all options, including potential assignment of the freight license agreement, termination of the agreement, and potentially rail bank. Current freight license agreement is RTC's third such agreement purchasing the line. The template for agreement is based on the concept that the rail line could primarily pay for itself with revenue from freight and recreation rail. 2018, after Iowa Pacific, RTC's second operator, neglected the line and used the line mainly to store rail cars in the Wattsville Slough area. RTC sought its third operator. However, the line was down and in a serious state of disrepair. 2017 storms completely washed out two locations. There was storm damage of seven sites. Debris removal needed for the entire line. Therefore, when St. Paul and Pacific Railway negotiated the current RTC, they required that RTC perform initial repairs to the line. Initial repairs include all storm damage, as well as damaged bridges, overpasses, trestles, culverts, and track needed for freight and recreation rail for the entire line. RTC secured FEMA funding, storm damage repairs, RTC also has now passed Measure D, which has a category for rail preservation. However, the cost of all repairs far exceed available revenue. State and federal funding for freight repairs is also limited, and the Santa Cruz branch rail line does not well against other high priority freight projects in other regions of the state and the nation. Nonetheless, RTC has been working on trying to restore the line freight rail service. RTC has completed millions of dollars of repairs to date. Despite our progress, staff estimate that 50 to 65 million of additional repairs are needed to restore regular freight service. This estimate is for repairs needed for heavy freight and recreational rail service only, not include trail construction or work needed for a future commuter rail service. Passage of recent transportation legislation may seem like a good time to apply for and receive grant funding to pay for all this. However, the likelihood of RTC and funding for freight be based on project applicable performance measures. In other words, grant reviewers will consider how much freight we move versus the cost of the project to determine whether a grant award should be considered. Typical high priority freight project in California be work at the Port of Oakland, Port of Long Beach, one of the railways or highways leading to the facility. Since the branch line is currently does not move freight and has limited prospects for future freight on Watsonville, the branch line does not control and state funding programs designed for freight movement. So why is RTC discussing rail bank? Initially, RTC started discussing rail banking as a potential response to Paul and Pacific's notice of intent to abandon the Santa Cruz branch rail line. We have 30 days to respond. 
if Holland Pacific were to follow through with that notice and RTC was to take no action, RTC would be at risk losing the continuity of the rail line. What's really at risk? Railroad title issues are complicated. And RTC holds a mix of fee and easement ownership in the Santa Cruz branch rail line. On complete abandonment, a railroad may lose any rights to possess or transfer parcels of land in the quarter to which it merely holds an easement whose use is limited to railroad purposes. RTC understandably took the abandonment notice very seriously and staff started exploring rail banking possibility to preserve the rail right away. Since the notice to rail bank would be required, as was stated, within 30 days of filing for abandonment. But what exactly is rail? Rail banking was designed to prevent railroad payments from reverting under state law and underlining fee owner after a railroad discontinues service. Rail banking provides an alternate, alternative to completely abandoning a railroad right away by allowing a railroad to negotiate a trail use agreement with a prospective rail operator while preserving the rail right away for potential future freight deactivation. Rail banking is a voluntary process whereby a freight railroad company and a trail agency enter an agreement use the corridor that has been approved for abandonment as a trail or for some other use, including commuter rail or potentially a rail with a trail. Until such further time when the railroad might corridor again for heavy freight rail service. So when rail banking is Rail banking is a separate decision from community debate as to whether the rail line should be temporarily repurposed for an interim trail prior to freight reactivation. As RTC explored rail banking, we also found that it would provide relief to property rights associated with RTC's planned construction of a trail within the rail right away, even if there is no desire. As mentioned earlier, some of the rail property is held as easements for rail purposes, creates potential complications for constructing a trail. Underlying property owners claim that a trail is not trail and is therefore not permitted on the easement. Although the situation may not seem significant, RTC holds most of the title and fee, and RTC negate, negotiate the objections of only one property owner significantly impact trail. Rail banking does not eliminate Potential property owner claims. However, after rail bank, any property owner claims that allege that a trail is not permitted in the railroad east be directed to the federal government as a process for addressing their financial claim. Rail, rail banking thereby provides protections to the RTC from potential financial liability associated with building an active transportation trail along rail leases in any duration. If RTC were to rail bank portion of the line, RTC would be responsible for preserving the rail bank right away for, for reactivation of freight rail. Preservation efforts allow for a trail when it's not required. RTC could leave the rails in place, configure the rail, rail and trail, continue planning for future passenger rail service. RTC could even choose to continue some freight service on the line while the line is rail bank. Prior to any advanced discussion of rail bank, RTC and our operator, St. Paul and Pacific Railroad, reached out to Roaring Camp as a potential freight operator, successor to the ACL agreement. However, Roaring Camp had concerns about taking on any significant responsibilities for maintenance of the rail line. Not only was Roaring Camp expecting RTC to perform initial repairs, they also did not want to be responsible for any long-term deferred maintenance and indicated that they would need to limit their exposure to normal wear and tear on the line. This is understandable, as maintaining a 150-year-old rail line is extremely expensive. In summary, rail banking will eliminate ownership constraints related to RTC's use of railroad easements or a trail, eliminate for the duration of rail bank the need to complete expensive repairs necessary for freight rail service, deferring the need to divert discretionary funds from other priority projects in Santa Cruz, or to implement a new dedicated local funding source 
to pay for the freight rail repairs. We'll also preserve the rail corridor in a manner that will provide local control and flexibility on decision making, including possibilities for future commuter rail trail. I'll also finally provide an avenue for the current rail operator to exit the license agreement and an agreement that in Holland Pacific Railroads, Roaring and RPC, all fine, not be financially viable. However, there are a number of factors that um, needs to be considered in determining whether and how to do rail bank on the Santa Cruz branch rail line. These issues include that the process for rail banking would require the filing with the Surface Transportation Board, which is federal aid agency, an application or request for exemption or authority to abandon. That in Colin Pacific Railroad continues to hold the freight easement on the Santa Cruz branch rail line has chosen not to follow through with their filing of a notice of, it, of abandonment, even though they still desire to terminate the lease agreement and extinguish their ownership of the freight easement. But the Felton line is also a freight rail line. Rail banking the Santa Cruz branch rail line would effectively leave rail ring camps potential freight operations as a stranded segment. Finally, that Roaring Camp has voiced opposition to rail bank Santa Cruz branch. RTC has been advised that if an agreement with Roaring Camp all and Pacific Railroad cannot be reached, RTC's only realistic method of rail bank Santa Cruz branch rail line may be to file for what is called adverse abandonment. Have the Federal Surface Transportation Board decide whether these two lines should remain part of the federal freight network. Reverse abandonment is a process when a person or entity that does not own the freight files for an abandonment request with the surface transportation. This process is typically initiated when there is no active freight service on a line and when the requesting party desires to have the freight line out of service so that the railroad right away can be used for purposes other than freight service, including rail bank. For RTC to be able to rail bank the Santa Cruz branch rail line, Roaring Camp's objections must be addressed. Last week, the RTC affirmed RTC staff preference to address Roaring Camp's concerns through negotiation in lieu of any potential future decision for adverse abandonment. Although RTC could file for adverse abandonment for rail bank Santa Cruz, the RTC owned Santa Cruz branch rail line allowing Roaring Camp's objections to be settled as part of those adverse abandonment and rail bank of the Santa Cruz branch rail line could be a long process to Roaring Camp's objection. Therefore, another potential legal approach was discussed would be for RTC file for adverse abandonment rate only on the Felton branch as an initial rail bank for Santa Cruz Termination of abandonment of freight on the Felton line would be based on whether there is there are realist, realistic expectations for profitable freight service on that line. The Surface Transportation Board does not regulate recreational rail, and the RTC would only be seeking to gain clarification whether the Felton line's current freight status can be used to stop rail bank Santa Cruz branch rail line. This action could potentially provide the resolution of the stranded line argument advance and separate of potential subsequent actions to abandon and rail bank Santa Cruz branch rail line and terminate the freight agreement. If the STB finds cause for abandonment, Boring Camp could leave their rails in place and continue the recreation rail service, including the beach. Boring Camp could also choose to use the Felton line for a fire break, which was a notable concern to the fire chief San Lorenzo Valley. Boring Camp could rail bank their line if they wish to secure federal protections or property rights associated with any easements that they own, similar to what RTC is contemplating for the Santa Cruz branch rail line. RTC really has no interest in having Boring Camp move their rails, nor does RTC desire to build a trail on the Felton branch. Again, the commission agreed with staff that adverse abandonment action 
not occurred. Instead, a negotiated agreement with Doring Camp in due consideration of RTC's financial situation is preferred. RTC understands that the rail line use is complicated and difficult issue, which will require collaboration and solution that is workable for all parties. So far, RTC has offered Roaring Camp a long-term lease of the portion of the Santa Cruz branch rail line that Roaring Camp uses today to ensure that they continue to run the recreational service boardwalk. RTC staff has also discussed the possibility of expanding recreational service Davenport. Nonetheless, Roaring Camp still opposes rail bank. I've said this many times, what railroad would want to be disconnected from the national rail network? I really understand their concern. Being disconnected can have implications and limitations for a railroad's ability to receive new equipment. Consideration, RTC has discussed financial considerations to help move equipment but if possible. However, trucking a locomotive is also complicated and requires additional investigation. Fortunately, RTC's negotiations with Roaring Camp did not go very far. Roaring Camp indicated their preference as the status quo over any hemp rail bank in Santa Cruz branch rail line. It's also important to note that Roaring Camp has been functionally disconnected from the main line since 2017 yet still has been able to continue providing beach train service. Yet the situation has left two of their locomotives stuck in Watsonville, unable to travel to Felton. RTEC was hoping to have all repairs completed by now, so Roaring Camp could move their engine. Fortunately, Capitola Trestle and the Seascape Trestles have been deemed out of service, and RTC has identified other cost repairs needed to restore freight service. RTC simply cannot currently afford and sees no realistic possibility of funding for the foreseeable future. RTC could just decide to leave the current freight license agreement with St. Paul and Pacific in place until its termination date of July 15, 2028. However, doing so would not make it more likely that RTC will find funding to be able to complete necessary freight repairs to reconstruct the line. In the meantime, we are being challenged in developing other projects on the line. Project designs are restricted by the need to accommodate freight rail in the short term, even though the line is non-functional and RTC cannot afford the repairs. Property rights issues for our rail projects are on the critical path and to reach construction, it'll be necessary to understand whether we need to acquire additional property rights fairly soon. The Commission understands that more information is needed to assess the problem and options moving forward. In the meantime, the Commission asks that I continue to work with Roaring Camp and call in Pacific to find a mutually agreeable solution that ensures the long-term success of Roaring Camp while protecting the fiscal sustainability of the RTC. Mayor Bruner, that is my report. I hand it back over to you for questions, comments, Thank you, Director Press. That was a lot of information to soak in. Um, <laughs> I will bring it to council members for questions. Any clarifying questions from council members regarding issue? Council member Myers. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, my understanding of agenda item is, and it, 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 I believe, um, did you need sort of a letter from council regarding um, recommendation that we express our opposition to the potential of the advance of first abandonment act? But I just wanted to number. I just wanted to clarify that. Thank you, um, Director. By, by the way. Um, and, but I just wanted to make sure I'm understanding that that's kind of action that, okay. that right. And that would be done by letter or is it expected that, okay, by letter. Thank you.
Are there any questions from other members, council member coming? Mayor, I'm, and thank you for that presentation, um, Preston. I had some questions because um, there's been some talk in the community about you know how rail could, how rail could function on that line, and while it sounds like there's you know obviously some challenges around certain segments of the rail that need to be repaired, I'm wondering if you could speak to like you know if in a perfect world we had the money to make the necessary repairs to the line, what would that would that allow us? to have freight passenger rail on those lines? Would there be anything that would kind of obstruct us being able to have those services outside of just repairs? In a perfect world, we would have the funding to um, make improvements to the rail line for commuter rail service and funding to, um, to build a trail um, within its right of way. Um, that's the biggest obstacle right now to um, being able to complete the project. But there's one other additional obstacle, and that's the property rights issue that I mentioned earlier. Um, some of the rail right away is owned by easement, and um, some of those easement issues would have to be resolved. Additional rights would be needed for a trail. Um, in addition to the, to the funding issues. Okay. I, I asked that because I think it um, sounds like, based on your comments, that the easement issues are largely related to trail. Um, and some folks in the community have been saying that those easements actually were related to being able to operate either like passenger or freight rail. So I just wanted to make sure that it was clear that you know, the one thing that's really keeping rail from moving is the funding for repairs. That is correct. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, and that's really the only question I have at this time. Yep. Um, I'll bring it to myself. That was actually one of my questions to the 50 to $60 million figure that you had mentioned for repairs is for rail and trail. Was that true or just for repairs on the line? It's actually only for repairs needed for freight rail. So due to our, our contract with um, St. Paul and Pacific Railway, we need to make repairs for them, use the rail line for freight, expanded recreational rail service. That number does not include the funding that we need for commuter rail service. That's estimated at being about a half a billion dollars, plus 25 million per year for operation. Uh, we can get grant funding for commuter rail service, but in order to be eligible for many of those grants, we need to first complete an environmental document, and then we would need to um, provide local match. We also don't. Uh, the trail um, big, uh, the funding needed for our trail project is independent of those two numbers. So the uh, trails uh, projects are moving forward independently, and um, that's going to be several hundred million dollars in addition to those other. One of the important things to note about doing the freight rail repairs versus commuter rail projects. Freight rail repairs are the minimum necessary for freight service. Um, in many of those instances, we would be doing um, minor rehabilitation work on many bridges that we feel would ultimately need to be replaced if we were to start commuter rail service. We really don't want to start new, reliable, modern rail service on a bridge that's 150 years old and scheduled for replacement. So go ahead and make the rail, freight rail repairs on a bridge that ultimately needs to be replaced. You may be throwing good money out. And, um, 
what is the timeline that uh, the commission is looking at? What is the next step on your end? Well, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to talk morning camp and see if um, we can kind of figure out a resolution. Um, we're under contract right now with St. Paul and Pacific for freight rail and expanded recreational rail service, and they want out of the agreement. Uh, Roaring Camp is interested in taking over that agreement, um, but uh, the financial um, hit on RTC would be fairly significant. Um, I'd like to gain a resolution as soon as possible because how projects are moving forward, and there's several um, significant grant opportunities um coming up uh and you know, once we have environmental clearance next step is usually to acquire additional right away so if any of those projects have easements some of them do um, we, would, we would want to know whether or not we need to acquire those additional rights start moving uh, those trout projects aren't scheduled to be environmentally cleared till the end of the year we do have a little bit of the rail uh, project, the, uh, okay. the trail project. The trail project. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Cummings. I did have one more question. I know that last year, I believe, um, there was a business plan that came before RTC related to rail. That sounds like it got installed. And I'm just kind of wondering what's, what's the next step with that because oftentimes, having these business plans in place makes an agency more likely to receive funding when they're applying. And so I'm wondering as well if that's something that's holding this up because that seems like, um, you know, if we've been you know, as a community committed to rail and trail point, um, you know, it would seem as if we'd be trying to do everything within our power to try to get funding, make these pairs and what we can to make sure that this moves forward. So I'm just kind of wondering if you might be able to speak to that and whether or not this, like, what, what were the issues around that business plan and whether that was back? So, um, although a business plan is very good business practice, um, it kind of lays out your concepts and financial costs about how a project will be funded, it's, it's not required. Um, RTC can still move forward with uh, trying to find the funding for an environmental as capable grant opportunities become available. The biggest hurdle right now is an environmental box. Um, many of these grant programs do require that have environmental clearance or apply for, for funding. Um, the other big obstacle, which was identified in the, the uh, business plan was the need for a local fund source um, to help provide the matching funds. Uh, Measure D does not provide any funding for new rail service, although we can use some of that funding for um, an environmental document. Um, that same pot of funding is also the funding that we um, uh, have available to us for freight rail. We're, we're competing against ourselves with making the freight repairs versus doing an environmental box. So the biggest obstacles are really um, finding the environmental document and, and really having an environmental document in place would be better if and when community is ready to move forward with permitting uh, if, if they're prepared by local funding necessary, which would most likely be a new tax. Um, to help leverage the state and federal grants uh, that would be needed. So that's kind of the situation that we're in right now. I think my commission wasn't ready at this particular time, but that doesn't mean that sometime in the future they might see a, a different landscape, be more comfortable with moving forward with clearing those obstacles. Uh, Council Member Brown. Thank you. Uh, I, um, I I just wanted to add here 
I think uh, the resource question and environmental clearance being very closely related to having the resources is is really the key point. And thank you, Director Preston. Um, but there's another dynamic, a political one, that I think is worth mentioning here, um, and largely the reason that uh, I was interested in when I was approached by Councilmember Cummings bringing this to the um, to the City Council, and that is that we are currently in the makeup of the mission, which is comprised of representatives from all of the municipal jurisdictions and then the members of the County Board of Supervisors has shifted um, and we are in a deadlock. That's the reality. We are in a deadlock on uh, virtually every consideration that we make that um, is related to potential abandonment, uh, whether the track will remain, our, um, have the federal safety net for both Roaring Camp and um, the kind of legal safety net for the RT with respect to payments. And so we are stalled. Uh, while I believe we're aware that there is an initiative that will likely be on the, or that will be on the June ballot, um, which is intended to, um, it will ask the community to weigh in about whether or not they want to have uh, the track torn up. Uh, something that adverse abandonment would facilitate, that it would be needed um, for a permanent, wide recreational trail without trail. And, um, and so it's tricky. Every decision we make, there is a consequence for, uh, you know, a variety of parties and interests. And, um, and so I think it's just, you know, I, I don't want to get into the, you know, all of that debate. I'm sure we'll hear from members of the public who are on, uh, I can see the, the, participant list and um, so you'll hear from folks about their perspective but that's the reality we are really stalled and so I I just want to I also want to um, you know say that the RTC staff is really in a difficult position now in terms of project delivery um, because our stuck and um, you know at, at the moment I uh, I believe that uh, we we it's absolutely our responsibility to take the concerns of um, one of our uh, beloved local businesses seriously. Um, and I believe that maintaining the possibility of uh, future rail, passenger rail, um, while there is a, a, some, there is a possibility legally, technically, that tracks um, reinstalled after they had been removed and a uh, Know, full service trail built. Um, the likelihood is um, very, very. Small. There's no evidence that it's ever happened uh, in cases where rail banking occurred. So um, while we are stuck, and um, nobody's happy with that that situation, um, it seems that there you know, there will be some other decisions made, and you know the public will have an opportunity to weigh in on that in June, and so. The conversation may shift as a result of that as well. So I'm sorry that wasn't a question. That was I just <laughs> wanted to add that though for it to, into the uh, the picture. Thank you. That. Thank you. Um, um, at this time, I will take it out to the public. If there are no further questions. I'm going to invite public comment. You're interested in commenting on item number 20, opposition to the potential adverse abandonment actions for heavy freight rail service on the Felton Branch Line and Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. Press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. And when it's your turn to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set minute. I will look at our attendee list. Like we have well hands up. The first one is Brian Trail Now. Hi, this is Brian Trail Now. Thank you. RTC was awarded the most funds per population in California, only second to Los Angeles. You know why? Because Guy Preston knows what he's doing. He knows how to get the money. He knows what gets funded. He knows how to fix transportation. We really need to allow him to do his job. 
can't try to regulate him on that. There are three transportation corridors, Highway 1, Soquel, and the Coastal Corridor that all need to go. One of them is closed right now. And the other two are going to be under construction for two and a half years. People don't realize it, but the studies have shown a world-class trail on the Coastal Trail will have 10 times more users than a train, equivalent to a half a, a single highway line. That's what we're talking about in the way of mobility. The issue here is Ms. Clark, owner of Boring Camp, is parking her amusement park train on the Santa Cruz Boardwalk Trestle, publicly owned trestle, and it's blocking the world class trail. We're asking Ms. Clark to work with Guy and come up with a win win solution. We're suggesting that they move Boring Camp boarding operations to Depot Park. Um, quite possibly, even a world class solution would be to have a e-trolleys coming from the Felton. And now we create a whole new access road where Metro could even go. So we're asking the city to support Guy Preston. He knows what he's doing and back him as he negotiates with Ms. Clark, who is the private owner of Roaring Camp. And just let's just remember how bad beach traffic is. Um, I know many people who have been injured because of the tracks are in the middle of the roundabout. Very dangerous. Let's take this opportunity. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Brian. Next caller is Barry Scott. Welcome, Barry. Well, thank you. Um, let me let me just point out something. Mark Stone was my guest on Mid County Democratic Club meeting last week, and I had him in a, in a meeting talking about this whole thing. He said, "Look, rail banking doesn't work. Pulling the tracks up means they'll never come back. You guys lift the tracks; they're never going to come back." I want to point out that the RTC is obliged in the ACL, the agreement with Progressive, to complete all rail repairs. That's a contractual obligation. It's true that Progressive asked to get out, but that was before Roaring Camp came in. So right now, Roaring Camp is a subcontractor. Um, I, I, you know, Director Preston talked about lack of freight since 2017. Well, that's when the storms were. A lack of freight because we haven't done the repairs could be a connection there. And I know a lot of money, but we need to we need to move it consistently with the TCAA and every study that says we need rail transit. Um, by the way, heavy freight is not a, a term, it's just freight. Freight or no freight, not scary heavy freight. Um, I want to say that federal freight status is the only protection our infrastructure has from the whims of local politics that can change with a single election or the change of a single supervisor. So let's do the RTC a favor by passing this resolution and blocking this ill-advised and unlikely to succeed abandonment move. Ask our friends in Watsonville to pass a similar city council resolution and consider a future resolution condemning the Greenway Initiative uh, and commit to protect our regional rail plans. Please. Thank you. Thank you for your public input. Our next caller is Marcus Miller. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, good evening. Uh, Mayor Bruner and Council Members. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a professional civil engineer and a 39-year resident of the City of Santa Cruz. And I just want to uh, mention a couple of things. Climate change is very real. Uh, we're all suffering from the adverse effects, and they're getting worse. This is not going to get better. There is no silver bullet that's going to solve that problem, but there is silver buckshot. And rail is part of that silver buckshot. That's how we're going to reduce vehicle miles traveled. That's how we're going to get trucks off the road. That's how we're going to reduce greenhouse gases. Rail banking is a, is a term that sounds really good. The fact of the matter is that there is not a single case anywhere in the 39-year history of rail banking where tracks have been removed, rail constructed, you know, pavement, and, you know, all this stuff. The, the trail removed and the tracks put back. It doesn't happen. And one thing that uh, Director Preston did not mention 
but I'll bring up tonight is that at last Thursday's RTC meeting, the RTC staff presented a plan for removing the rail bridges across Highway 1 uh, as part of the Highway 1 widening project in Aptos. And with rail banking, those rail branches, those rail bridges do not need to be put back. And guess what? The plan is not put the rail bridges back. How likely do you think it is that once the highways widen and the rail bridges are gone, those rail bridges are going to come back? They're not. Federal protection of our freight railroads is the only way to protect the integrity of our railroad line into the future and make sure that when the time comes, we can implement passenger rail and get 20,000 cars off the road every single day. Thank you. Thank you for calling in. Our next caller is Rafa Sonantez. Go ahead, Rafa. Hi, uh, good afternoon, council members and mayor. Um, my name is Rafa Sonnenfeld, and uh, thank you for considering this letter today. I'm calling to oppose the adverse abandonment of the uh, Felton Branch Rail Line and the Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line. And um, I'd like the city to continue to support both rail and trail. Um, I think uh, having a rail, a rail connection to Monterey County, uh, to Gilroy, and the future high-speed rail, California high-speed rail is really critical for the, the future transportation infrastructure of our region. And um, uh, I'm worried that adverse abandonment will um, make it more challenging to uh, complete the repairs that we need in order to have rail. Um, will increase the environmental uh, regulations through CEQA that, that would be exempted if there is still tracks in the ground. Um, so uh, I'd encourage uh, the city to uh, support our rail and trail and oppose the adverse abandonment. Thank you. Thank you for being in. Next caller is Kyle Kelly. Greetings, Mayor Bruner, Vice Mayor Watkins, Council members, and RTC staff. I'm Kyle Kelly. I serve on the City of Santa Cruz's Transportation and Public Works Commission, uh, but I speak to you now as an individual advocate for inclusive communities. It was only three years ago, on March 8, 2019, that the Santa Cruz RTC wrote a letter to the California Transportation Commission stating their obligation under state law requiring Proposition 116 bond to be used for inner city passenger rail projects connecting the city of Santa Cruz with the Watsonville Junction or other rail projects within Santa Cruz County which facilitate recreational commuter inner city and inner county travel. In the letter, the executive director, Guy Preston, unequivocally stated, again, quote, the RTC is committed to meeting the requirements set by Proposition 116 and CTC resolution. The RTC and shortline operators have made significant repairs and upgrades to railroad infrastructure, Santa Cruz County voters approved Measure D in 2016, which includes funds for rail line maintenance and repairs. Since that time, the RTC has evaluated service options for public transit service in the corridor, including potential station locations, costs, ridership, projections, and schedules. While there have been proposals by some community members and groups to rail bank or remove the railroad tracks, in January 2019, after extensive analysis and public input conducted through the Unified Corridor Study, the RTC board unanimously affirmed its commitment to leave the railroad infrastructure in place, maintain freight rail service, and institute high capacity public transit service, end quote. So we really need to meet the commitment that we made years ago and live up to the standards we set for greenhouse gas reduction targets and the absolute boost to our community's health, well-being that comes with investing in public transit. Here in Santa Cruz especially, uh, we are about to grow by about 3,700 new homes. Nope, that's all. I would like traffic to come by train, not by car. Thank you. Thank you so much for your public comment. Our next caller is Lonnie Faulkner. Lonnie? Uh, hi there. Lonnie? Hi there. Hi, thank you, Mayor Brunner and Senate Council. Members, Equity Transit opposes adverse abandoning of both the Roaring Camp Ramp and Santa Cruz Branch Lane. 
Brewing Camp has been owned by the same family since 1963. That's 59 years. Brewing Camp relinquished their first right of refusal in purchasing the track so that the RTC could bring passenger rail to our community. And I paraphrase Milani Clark, the owner of Brewing Camp. My family was assured the rail line was an extremely important asset to the county and that the RTC had worked hard to line up funding for the state and that the sale to the RTC was for the benefit of the entire community. The RTC assured Rory Camp the line would be used for rail, thanks to funding from Proposition 116, which specifically calls for a commitment to rail service. In response to Rory Camp, in response, Rory Camp cleared the way for the RTC to purchase the new line. Now, the RTC is targeting Rory Camp's Felton branch line as the first step towards forced abandonment of the full Santa Cruz branch line, which is a betrayal of a commitment made by the RTC to Roaring Camp, the people of Santa Cruz County, the state of California, promising to bring rail to Santa Cruz County, end quote. How can Roaring Camp trust any long-term leases made by the current or future RTC when obviously all intentions made by the RTC are be, uh, of Roaring Camp are being aggressively challenged? So during the February 3rd RTC meeting recently, Roaring Camp lawyers and numerous rail experts, some with connections with the SPB, made clear statements in direct opposition to the statements made by Mr. Preston. The theme was consistent. Abandonment and rail banking will risk the future of our tracks and the future of passenger rail will be put at risk for our community. Not to mention this. Thank you. Thank you. Our next. Caller has a phone number ending in 7496. Hello, um, this is Matt Farrell, and I'm calling to encourage the council to uh, support opposing adverse abandonment on both the Felton and the Santa Cruz branch line. I think that the previous speakers have uh, made very compelling arguments about why take that action. And I won't take more of your time repeating their state. Please um, support uh, fellow council members that have brought forward. Thank you. Thank you, Matt Farrell. Our next caller is Sally for Trail and Rail. Thank you. Um, so I'm Sally Arnold, and I want to really thank the council for considering writing a letter opposing the rail banking, the adverse abandonment rail banking of either the Felton Line or the Santa Cruz Branch Line. And I really, um, I want to thank uh, Council Member uh, uh, Cummings, who pointed out that the, uh, I think it was Cummings anyway, that pointed out the 6,000 emails that were received by the RTC. A lot of times people say, oh, 6,000 emails, it's so controversial. Not if they are all saying the same thing, which is don't do the adverse abandonment. Of the, the, my last count, it was about 6,000 opposed to adverse abandonment and two in favor. That's not controversial. Also, I want to say that, um, you know, Council Member Brown mentioned that, um, you know, there's a whole political dimension to this at the RTC. And, and she's, I think she's absolutely correct here. And that's why your influence is really appropriate at this time. Yes, transit's expensive. There's no doubt about it. That's why we need to provide the political will to show the community supports the rail and trail project. That kind of community will will help us get grant money. And I appreciate that, uh, you know, Commissioner. I mean, that uh, Director Preston is in a tough spot with his commission being split as it is right now. But the community is not split fifty-fifty. The community is like six thousand to two, and so. You know, this false equivalency, just because not every single human on the planet agrees is, that makes it controversial, it's not correct. And so I think that we it's time for the community to show the commissioners where where we're going here, that we want rail and trail, we want it all. We know it's hard. We support our commissioners and our and RTC staff doing that hard work. And I think that your letter opposing adverse abandonment could help with that. Thank you. Thank you, Sally Arnold. Our next caller is Sean.
Go ahead. We were told in last week's RTC meeting that um, the discussion about uh, about banking on that line was uh, supposed to be private. It was the public was never supposed to know. All the local fire chiefs object to this because it will restrict their ability to fight uh, wildfires. Uh, Jack Brown sent me a uh, sent me a a simple map showing the fire line. And it runs uh, parallel this time with uh, uh, with uh, the rail. And that it's not unusual for a rail line to become the front line um, fighting fires. Let me ask you something: uh, Are you aware that the newest and best fire suppressant uh, uh, in use today is made possible by a local Santa Cruz uh, uh, office right down by? Uh, Right down by uh, um, Safeway. Yeah, Jeff Denholm, local circle, 100% uh, biodegradable, non toxic. It's safer for firefighters to use, safer for uh, well water. Now, Santa Cruz, in this way, can help the rest of the world, but it's not able to save itself from the corruption of the RTC. You can hear, add a, add a guy Preston's mouth today, you know, everybody's. Talking about uh, uh, the coastal rail line, this is just a, a tactic that they want to use there. Uh, and uh, guy, uh, uh, your question: What's it worth? What are the lives, health of all the people uh, in the county that are going to use uh, a, a, an electric train to get out of here on a uh, uh, during an emergency evacuation? You never hear the RTC talk about. It. And when 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 someone wants to know why why uh, uh, Santa Cruz firefighting efforts were limited. They're going to come back to, to this council meeting. Thank you for your public comment. Are there any other attendees that would like to call in for public comment on item number 20, opposition to potential adverse abandonment actions for heavy freight? Rail service on the Felton Branch Line and Santa Cruz Branch Rail Line, and specifically to direct the mayor to notify the Santa Cruz Regional Transportation Commission that the Santa Cruz City Council opposes potential adverse abandonment actions for freight rail service on the Felton Branch Line and Santa Cruz Branch Line. As the one caller commented for freight travel. Heavy is not necessary. Okay, I will bring it. Oh, we have one more caller. Caller ending in 4487. Ten. Hello, this is Joanne here with Ozzy with Hello Joanne. Um Train camp is current contract by freight on the Santa Cruz. An agreement reached with the current freight operators includes South County, where we're currently seeing growth service. I'd just like you to know that the rest is not pulling out. They are very happy with our current. However, due to the passion by the RTC and bridges, Currently, freight is prevented from bringing the old and Watson Hill and beyond. Responsibility for the lack of access to freight located north of Watson rests with the RTC freight office. Targeting growing camp felt kept was then in Santa Cruz, felt felt branch line. RTC well intentioned claims that growing camp uh growing camp train felt um not in jeopardy and that, that they would engage with gauges in a long term. Well that belies the fact that change in ten years, as evidenced by what is now. They made a growing camp ten years ago and see where we are now. 
And after forced abandonment of the uh, Belton branch by Grip Brain Camp Federal Regulatory Protection, Deb and I are easy to operate in the area. It also makes it vulnerable, vulnerable less threatening. In essence, abandonment and rail banking is not a strategy. Threat the keep of rail in Santa Cruz. Thank you for your quick comment. For any other attendees on this item? Seeing none, I will bring it back to council for deliberation and action. So call on like Council Member Myers. Yeah, I want to, uh, I know my colleagues have brought this first of all, the motion, honor their work on, um, I won't make the motion, I do just want to make a couple of comments. Um, you know, I think that the city has expressed, I know multiple times, resolution, um, obviously, uh, building segment, segment fail uh, in the last year and programming multiple segments, um, our residents have been um, you know, you know, I'm obviously supportive of, 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 of quest to prepare the letter, not so abandonment. Um, and I really want to recognize council members, uh, Brown's comment in that, um, Stalemate, you know, that's sort of currently affecting progress at the RTC. You know, it's troubling in that it really is not only really affecting the ability to report on, on items, but just a very difficult situation, um, probably one of the most Important current council members, but as council members moving into made the comments that you need to think about the, um, the rail line about uh, making this to stay such that for 30 years or 40 years or maybe 50 years from now can enjoy that rail line, that rail line. Um, I'll be supportive today, um, and I, you know, I just I'm not clear why the bridges aren't are, are not able to be funded. Today's a world of infrastructure financing that a lot of money, but it doesn't seem like if money or a significant amount of money that would prevent you know financing either federal or state funds in the near So um, I think it's very important that uh, the rail, uh, I think it's, you know, don't, should not be giving up. Uh, so I'm supportive of, of the item. I appreciate Thank you, Council Member Myers. Council Member Cumming, and then Council Member Colin Terry Johnson. Mayor, I'm going to um, move the council's recommendation for this item so we can have a motion before us. And then I have comments. Um, yeah, one of the things back in 2019 when I first came on the council, I remember when um, at the time Mayor Watkins was cutting the ribbon <clears throat> at the newly built trestle that came in. It was a really great project that came in. Um, sooner than expected and under budget. And from a number of the talks that have, the speeches that have been given at that event, you know, one thing that was pointed out is this effort to bring rail and trail to our community has been going on since the late eighties. And um, so it's not something that although it might not be something that can happen really quickly, it's been the dedication and commitment of our local representative for that for such a long time. 
it's getting us to the point where we're actually seeing a lot of these projects um, come a reality. And over the past you know, three years, we've seen, sec you know, Vessel get built, we've seen the segment on the west side get built. We now have funding to move forward with um, another segment that will be um, off Bay Street. So consistently, we're seeing that, that the efforts over time are leading to us actually making rail and trail reality. And so um, I'm really, you know, I think we, we as a board need to do what we can to keep this reality alive. And my hope is that by sending this message to the RTC, that maybe some of our colleagues in the region will understand that Santa Cruz is really um, committed to making sure that not only are we supporting rail and trail, but we're also supporting local businesses that help um, support our local economy and um, you know, really make Santa Cruz somewhere that everyone can be. And I think it was also really important for us to take into consideration the, um, the fact that you know, these rail lines are used by firefighters and, and in many new ways move forward as we get better equipment and um, as we innovate our ways of fighting fire. And so I think that trying to preserve this whenever we possible is, is the best that we can do. And, and in addition to the motion, I think I'd just say, I'm just going to express this, but, you know, if there's an opportunity for Mayor you to speak with some of our um, state and federal representatives to let them know about the situation and our commitment to rail and the need for them to advocate for funding so that we can fix some of our critical infrastructure, I think that that would also go a long way for the community so that they know that we as representatives and um, that our mayor is backing rail and that, um, and that you know we're going to do everything we can to try to make sure that we get the funding we need to make sure that rail is reality uh, in our community. So um, with that, I will um, I'll end my comments there and um, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Trey Johnson. Uh, I'd like to give my colleague uh, Council Member Brown the opportunity to second so she probably forward and then I can speak. Um, thanks, Council Member Kalantari Johnson. I was um, happy to give that opportunity to others as I get to vote on motions at the RTC, but I will second that. Um, and I have some comments, but I'll, I'll, I'll wait until uh, Council Member Kalantari had the opportunity. And Thank you. Okay, so we have a motion on the floor. We have a first by Council Member Cummings and a second. Great. Okay. Council Member Ray Johnson. Thank you. Um, yes, I, I wanted to thank Director uh, Guy Preston for the very technical <laughs> report that you provided um, and my colleagues for bringing this forward. I appreciate the opportunity for our council to um, hear about this important issue and for our community members to little bit, learn a little more um, I will point that there are a lot of questions. There are a lot of technical questions. I think those are better reserved for an RTC meeting. And I would encourage and invite all, um, everyone, council colleagues and, and staff at city and community members to attend RTC meetings as, as time allows. Um, I will be supporting this motion as well. I mean, they were, the reasons were articulated very well by my colleagues as well as the callers. Um, one caller mentioned, you know, over 6,000 um, with, with almost all in support. Um, and I won't go into all of the reasons, but the, the concern that if, um, if we shut the door, we shut the door to opportunities in the future. Um, and we shut the door to prevention of um, really negative impacts of climate change and fire and everything that was listed in the future. So for all those reasons, I will be also supporting this recommendation. Thank you. Council Member Golder and then Council Member Brown. I too will support the motion. And I have a question, and I don't know if somebody can answer. I'm wondering how um, how the makeup of the RTC is determined in regards to the percentage of the people on the RTC versus the population of the area that they represent. 
Director Preston. So the um, uh, commission has 12 members, um, all five board of supervisors, representatives from each of the cities, and then three appointees uh, to the commission. Is there any consideration given to the fact that like Watsonville and Santa Cruz have the majority of the population of the county that they should have a higher representation in the group? Um, I th think that that is taken into consideration by Santa Cruz Metro when they make their So the appointees that come to Santa Cruz Metro, um, one has historically been um, a city uh, rep, one has historically been a Watsonville rep, and it's historically. Wouldn't that just make it balanced? Or, I mean, it's not really, I don't know, I just, I'm a little confused just since the majority of the county population lives in those two cities seems they should have a stronger voice. Is there a way to change uh, it moving forward so there's less of a stalemate? It's actually, um, uh, there's state legislation that is associated with the makeup of the RTC, so we would have to change that legislation. All right, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Boulder. Council Member Brown? Uh, yeah, so I, well, I'll just say, Council Member Golder brought this up. Um, yeah, I mean, that is a dynamic that can be somewhat frustrating, and um, it's not lost on those of us who participate in those meetings that um, it's consistently been the uh, Watsonville and Santa Cruz mm -hmm. representatives who have um, remained committed to maintenance of the rail line. Of, um, and um, so, but that's it, that's the um, again state legislation, and it's related to kind of all the interagency boards and things that uh, we we all participate in. So that, it's that's what it is. It is what it is for now. Um, <clears throat> but I raised my hand because I wanted to say um, uh, that before we take the vote, it sounds like we will have uh, unanimous support for this. And I just want to thank you all. Um, for me, it's really important. You know, I, I represent the city council on this body, and I have been um, doing my best to represent what I believe based on past actions and, um, you know, what I hear in the community is the interest of uh, the council and the majority of people in Santa Cruz. And so this really is really supports me, knowing that I'm taking the right position in the work that I'm doing to represent you all, represent the So I, I appreciate it and look forward to voting yes. And um, I also wanted to say, uh, Mayor Bruner, if uh, you do, uh, or if you're interested in following up on uh, Council Member Cummings' suggestion about communicating with our legislative representatives, I'd be happy to talk with you about that. I do, as the chair, participate in uh, legislative advocacy days, and we get to talk with our elected there, uh, both state and federal, um, but also have a uh, separate presentation, and I'm happy to work that. Wonderful. Thanks. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, Council Member Myers, and then Council Member. Uh, yes, I think the maker of the motion, Council Member um, Cummings. Um, I guess I'm, I'm really thinking about these bridge repairs. <laughs> and um, I was wondering if the maker of the motion would be amenable as the mayor crafts the letter that, you know, that infrastructure needs to be invested in and, and these need to somehow find the money. And now it seems an opportune time um, over the next decade to um, try to reach some of these and funny that's down. So my question for the maker of the motion is um, if you'd be amenable to also directing the mayor to express um, 
city's uh, urging of the RTC to prioritize the repair of the bridges uh, as part of their work, especially as related to available federal and state funds. Um, I also understand funding to measure the fee. So if the maker of the motion somehow would be willing to do that, I think that's better as well. Um, great. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Myers. Council Member King? I did want to follow up because I um, there were there was a speaker, um, a member of the public who spoke, and they also expressed wanting the city of Santa Cruz to send a letter uh, to the city of Watsonville asking them if they could put a similar item on their agenda. Uh, and also, they mentioned bringing forward a resolution committing to protection of rail infrastructure and rail campaigning in the city of Santa Cruz. And I was going to see if we could add that as a permanent. Um, well. um, so, you want to take a, a dab here at, at your amended motion? Yeah. So, it would be send a letter to the city of Watsonville asking their council to send a, also, rather, join us. Let me pray that. Direct the mayor to send a letter to Watsonville City Council asking them to consider agendizing item that would have them send a letter opposing adverse employment of the Santa Cruz and Felton Park. And the second one would be bring forward future meeting a resolution committing to protection of rail infrastructure and rail transit planning in the city of San Francisco. I should say rail and trail. But, okay. Rail and trail. Okay. And um, is there any prioritization repair of bridges included in yes. the letter? Is the second of the motion. Mayor, I might, I could maybe ask one more uh, in your, in that request uh, regarding prioritizing the first. Could we get a, could we get an, I don't know if there's been an analysis of bridge repairs or if that information exists, but great to receive that information as a council so we I don't know if you maybe press that in the letters. And that was clarified that the director pressed in the seascape and the Capitola bridge trestles. Is that correct? Those are the two trestles that are out of service. We have repairs that are needed on numerous bridges in addition to that. Um, the Aunt Natalie Pond. Um, uh, Trestle that's also out of service that's not needed to connect Belton line that also has additional um, expensive repairs. Um, and then there's more minor repairs on many of our additional bridges. <laughs> that, yeah, we have uh, done um, planning level analysis on, on the costs of these repairs, but they're the minimum cost to uh, have these bridge, bridges serve as. Uh, potentially using them for a, a commuter rail and playground. Great. So thank you for clarifying that. So it sounds like a prioritization repair of the bridges that are out of service would be the language along that line to be included in the letter. Is that okay with Motion maker, Dexter. Okay, Mayor. Thank you. Um, I I think that will, you know, this this item. I'm really glad we had the opportunity um, to learn more. I certainly did over this past week and a half, 
And um, this is such a vital part of our um, city and county and um, keeping rail transportation open as a viable transportation option for our county is really important. And um, I'm happy to be able to support our representative on this commission in this way. So I look forward to um, moving forward. Um, and so I will ask for city clerk to do a roll call vote. Council member Helen Perry Johnson. Aye. Holder. Aye. Cumming. Aye. Brown. Aye. Myers. Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins. Aye. And Mayor Brunner. Aye. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Director Preston, for your time and your information. Appreciate it. You're very welcome. Thank you for your input. Okay, our next item. This is item number 21 on the agenda. It's the mid-year update. For members of the public for streaming this meeting, we will be taking public comment for items 21.1 and 21.2. If these are items you want to comment on, now is the time to call in using the instructions on your screen. The order will be a presentation of the item by staff, followed by questions from council. We will then take public comment and then return to the council for deliberation and action. I would like to invite uh, Bobby McGee and Lupita Alamos from our finance department uh, for the first presentation. Hey, thank you, Mayor Broner, and uh, good evening, and good evening to members of the council. Let's share my screen here. Went through this once before. All right, are you able to see that now? Wonderful. Okay, on tonight's agenda, um, we wanted to do an overall outlook of where the city is and the, the budget issues that we're faced with. Um, talk a little bit about the revenue trends that we're currently observing and some of the risk factors that we continue to monitor. Um, go over some of the highlights of the budget adjustments that you have inside of into packet and then um, talk a little bit about next year's budget outlook as we have just started the process of building uh, fiscal year 2023 budget and then finally to inform the council of what we're looking at for the budget calendar. and so with respect to the overall outlook at this time um, i'd like to invite the city manager uh, to provide any for all commentary and uh, thoughts on the on the macroeconomic perspective Thanks, Bobby. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council and community members. Uh, before our, fi our finance jump into tonight's uh, mid-year update, I wanted to provide a, a broad overview of current trends uh, based on the most recent data that we have. Um, some good news and bright spots. We are seeing some incremental recovery um, and improvements over the last uh, few quarters, as well as when we year over year uh, for all of our major revenues. Um, I do just want to say that this has been modest growth. Um, just for the last quarter, third quarter of, of 2021, which July, September, uh, we finally saw a return of pre-pandemic levels for sales tax and TOT. But that's been tempered a bit by the significant increase and um, ongoing impacts um, from inflation, as well as um, those numbers not being reflective of some of the disruption that we expect to see when we get uh, the fourth quarter results, as well as moving into this 
year from the impacts that Omicron uh, variant you know, had impacts on our on our local economy. So I would describe um, you know, the first bullet as being cautiously optimistic that our economy is beginning to show signs of life. Uh, we balance that with some ongoing long-term uncertainty, uh, not knowing how the pandemic is going to affect our local economy, our small businesses, um, tourism, travel, as we look out over the long term. And so as we move in to the 2022-2023 budget process, as well as the council's strategic plan work, uh, it's really an opportunity for us to build up a long-term financial model that allows us to plan for some of that uncertainty ahead is to balance um, resources with um, our operational needs. Um, and although we've seen some, some improvement over the last quarters, I want to also just emphasize that we also continue to have some significant capital and operational um, unfunded needs. I spoke a little bit about that earlier today as we talked about um, our homeless response action plan, as well as some of the other uh, priorities with as part of our re Santa Cruz effort um, and downtown revitalization work. We know that despite these recent gains in revenues, um, that our needs far, far outpace our resources. That's also true of our, of our capital uh, and infrastructure needs as well. Uh, so you'll hear a little bit more of that as Bobby and we move through today's presentation. And we'll be having, of course, many more conversations with them as well into uh, this next budget cycle. Uh, but thanks for being able to give a, just a general overview as we dive into Thanks. Thank you, sir. I appreciate the comments. Okay, and so um, current revenue trends, um, what we're looking at is that the mid-year revenue trends continue to show signs of recovery, um, particularly in the sales tax area. Um, however, we do want to caution that by saying that overall, the fiscal year 22 general fund revenues um, are projected to increase about 9% over what we saw in 2019, uh, which was obviously pre-pandemic levels. However, that is not keeping up with inflation. So while the recovery has been strong, understand that expenses have gone up significantly more than uh, we had initially anticipated. And so when we're looking at these revenue trends and projecting out into the future the rest of this year and, and a portion of next year, we are still monitoring a number of unknowns uh, at this time, such as the economic impact of Omicron. We don't know if this is going to continue to fade or if we may see a double dip in, uh, in COVID cases. Hopefully that is not the case, but it's something for us to monitor. Um, the projected revenue obviously is dependent upon spring break tourism outcome. And as of right now, we remain optimistic that we'll have a strong uh, tourism season uh, during spring break, but um, I just can't be certain at this time. We are expecting uh, interest rates to continue to rise over the next several quarters, and that's going to have an unknown effect, as well as the impacts of uh, not only overall inflation, but, but oil prices. Um, as I'm sure you all have seen as you've filled up your cars recently, the, the price of fuel has shot through the roof uh, over the last few months, and, and that may continue. Historically, we've, we've noticed that prices start to go up around February, not peak in February. So um, we're, we're a little concerned about how that would uh, affect overall revenue. However, uh, the general fund revenue trends, just wanted to highlight a few of the key items within the general fund. Um, you all have seen this graph before. The fiscal year 22 projected is the gray line up on top. And, and you can see we continue to uh, expect strong sales tax receipts through the end of this fiscal year, as well as increases in property tax, uh, transient occupancy tax. And then there's a slight reduction in fees and charges, although we are seeing Again, increased development activity, increased demands for services and parks and recreation and, and the associated fees. Um, overall, again, we're not sure that we're going to make pre-pandemic levels throughout the entire general fund by the end of the year, but the recovery has been going well. 
Okay, and so I'm going to move into the fiscal year 22 uh, mid-year budget adjustments. And I know you have a, a, a very comprehensive list uh, within your agenda packets, but we did want to provide just a few highlights of some of the things that we are looking at. Um, on the revenue side, parks and recreation, as I mentioned, is seeing a, a pretty significant demand for services. And so the revenue is increasing uh, proportionally along with um, increased demands. Um, the fire uh, strike team reimbursements are higher than had been previously budgeted um, to the effect of about $100,000. And then on the expense side, we do have a number of uh, key items that um, that we, we wanted to highlight, such as the recreation programming, along with increased demand for services, we need the increased appropriations and general fund adjustments, which allow for those services to be provided. Um, the Poganev lower uh, meadow remediation, um, which is, I, I can certainly allow uh, other departments to talk to some of those points if they if you had additional questions. Um, some personal protective equipment for fire personnel. We did have a number of items that discussed with us that are in need of replacement at this time. Um, the special election costs from the, the previous election, the incremental amount of what was originally anticipated and what was ultimately billed is about $70,000. Um, the SC Memorial Cleanup, uh, $86,000. Some additional COVID medical supplies, the, the amount of about $40,000. And then the reserve fire engine pumper um, needs some additional maintenance just to keep it operational. And that's about you know, going across the 60 ,000. So some other fund adjustment highlights. Um, we have a matching our field park surface some water meters. And then we wanted to draw your attention to the carbon fund projects. Um, so there's a number of items that are listed that are specific to the carbon. Um, so I'll let you read those. And then uh, the budget outlook for the next fiscal year. So I know that the council has seen this model a, a number of times. Um, we've continued uh, with sim very similar assumptions to what you've seen in the past. This model includes uh, updated actual revenues as of December 31st, as well as our projections that I just talked about moving forward here. Um, this, over the course of the next uh, 10 years, includes very modest personnel growth. Um, the ARPA funds are reflected in fiscal year 21 and 23. That's why you see the, uh, um, the actual amounts a little bit higher in fiscal years 21 and 23. Um, we have not received the uh, fiscal year 23 ARPA funds yet. Um, I have had a, a couple of people suggest to me that we are expecting to see those this spring. I have not seen any guidance to that. I wanna be clear that um, at this point, that's a rumor and um, I've not seen any guidance as to when exactly we are expecting to receive that. It continues to, uh, the, the word we've gotten is, to be sometime in fiscal year. Um, the homelessness uh, phase one programs that were approved by the council in December um, are $4.2 million for the first year. We are expecting that figure to grow in the future. Um, the, the demands on those programs are expected to get more expensive over time. And uh, we currently have this built into the model at a modest 4.2. Um, with an inflationary factor attached to that. Um, this model actually includes $5 million in un unfunded, uh, currently unfunded capital project needs uh, starting in fiscal year 23. As you all know, that um, barely puts a dent into the city's uh, uh, overall unfunded capital needs. This model includes absolutely no new revenue sources at all no new programs or services, no expansion of any existing programs or services, and no new personnel added to the overall budget. And then, as you all know, the rate of inflation has um, been significantly high over the last year. However, for the purposes of modeling, um, from the data we've seen, we expect that that will level off, and that will continue to grow at a rate of about 2.5% two, two over the course of the next 10 years. And so again, drawing your attention to the uh, to the graph on the left, as you can see um, on the red line there, um, 
the overall uh, general fund budget meets its its bottom line target with, without reserves at about fiscal year 28. And at that point, the city starts to run into the it's completely out of it. And that's just with our existing program. So we definitely have a structural and so knowing that we have a structural deficit within the general funds, the guidance that we've provided to departments is that um, we're going to, to try to tackle that over the course of a couple of years. And so in this first year, the fiscal year 2023 budget strategy is to have a target reduction of about $2.5 million in overall general fund expenditures, which are spread out among all of the supported departments. These cuts need to be structural in nature um, and they should be focused on non-core programs and services. Uh, we've shared with departments that if there are one-time cuts that they are proposing, that we're happy to look at those. Um, but overall, we need to find structural cuts in order to balance them. We will continue to um, pursue greater cost recovery on uh, any uh, fees, for example, that, um, that need to be looked at. We're going to continue to identify any areas where we find federal or state grants, federal aid, any other uh, opportunities to bring in additional revenue. Continue to work with our legislative representatives on our legislative platform to advocate for additional resources. Um, the finance department in conjunction with the uh, city manager's office will continue to work with the council, um, which is now an ad hoc budget and revenue on identifying potential new revenue sources and how do we tap in. Um, as the city manager indicated, we are going to start working on a long range financial plan, um, which, uh, which will tackle some of these issues as, as well as some other issues, including capital needs. Um, and, and as part of that, we'll develop a strategy to address some of these capital investment programs. Okay, and that brings us to the overall budget calendar. So we've started. Uh, the budget process had a kickoff meeting, to, meeting just a couple uh, weeks ago. And so we will continue to have meetings with departments and work with departments on their proposed uh, budget solutions for fiscal year 23 um, between now and, and the end of May. And then uh, in May, we are expecting, in April, I'm sorry, uh, we are expecting that the uh, capital improvement program will be reviewed by the various commissions that we can take a look at that. And then we're currently planning on uh, holding the budget hearings on May 24th and 25th and asking the council uh, to adopt next year's budget on June 3rd. So that is the end of my presentation and I am here to uh, answer any questions that the council may have. Are there any uh, questions from the council members? Hey, uh, we have council member coming. Uh, thank you for that presentation. Um, I'm informed of the 2.5 million, million in structural cuts definitely not going to be an easy um, task for us given that we had to make some serious structural cuts um, over the past uh, few years. Um, COVID and now, and then they're just through the recovery. Definitely been difficult. Um, we did receive, did hear from um, some city staff, and I know that there's certain departments where um, with some of the work that people have been doing, they've actually been you know, chipping in more of their fair share to kind of meet the demands and needs of the city. And so, wondering how we're going to balance. City workload um, and demand um, with having to make some of these cuts. And maybe Matt, that's a maybe question yeah. for you. But um, I know in particular, um, you know, when events weren't occurring, uh, we shifted around our staff, Parks and Rec, who were managing the Civic Center. And now that we have events coming back, it sounds like some of those folks' workloads are going to meet the demands of all these events that are going on. Plus. Um, there are other obligations, so I was wondering if you have any 
thought around how we're going to city's needs and also not burn out our staff. Okay, um, I'll jump in here, Bonnie. Um, the question, Councilmember Cummings. I would I would just start by saying that our our operations are stretched thin. I think the volume and pace of work right now is not sustainable for our organization as a whole, and you know, our staff have been incredibly resilient and creative in the way we've redeployed services throughout the pandemic. We directed services uh, to programs and services that we're able to deliver as we kind of temporarily phase out other things like special events, uh, mentioning uh, Councilmember Cummings. Um, but another $2.5 million reduction is not insignificant on the heels of having had to make other reductions. Um, and I think it ties to the discussion we had earlier today about the need to keep exploring other revenue opportunities. Um, of course, we want to continue to be more efficient, uh, more effective in the work we're doing. We need to continue reprioritizing and ensuring that we're spending our time on the right things. And at the same time, we have a need for additional resources. I think be able to continue to provide the standard of service that the council and the community expect and deserve. And um, that's what that discussion around exploring this additional sales tax measure, as one example, along with the other uh, areas Bobby had outlined, are going to be important. Yes, and then, Bobby, you mentioned that kind of long-term financial planning. I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit, kind of provide community and board um, conversation to get a sense of, of what that looks like. Sure, um, and thank you, Mayor Brunner and uh, uh, Councilmember Cummings. Um, the uh, the overall budget, as it sits currently, has a structural deficit, and so I want to be very clear that the two point five million in cuts this year is year one of two years of budget solutions, absent other types of budget solutions, such as a revenue measure or uh, other income that is able to support the general fund. So. While we have a cut this year, right now, the way things stand, if nothing changes, we're anticipating that there would be an additional cut next year. And that's part of what the, the work that we will be doing as the overall uh, long range financial plan is we've got to figure out ways to deal with this budget for not only the operational budget, but the capital budget as well, because the city has a very large amount of unfunded capital needs and, and these, these projects are very, very important. And how are we going to address these things moving forward um, is in question right now. And so um, part of the work that we'll be doing is creating a plan. How do we deal with capital? How do we deal with the operating? And uh, and coming back to the council with uh, what staff feels is most important critical core services versus what is nice to have, but we may not afford to do it absent. Those are all the questions I have for right now. Thank you. Okay, any other members? Council Member Brown? Mayor, uh, so I have a question about uh, the, specifically the city manager budget adjustment, um, and it didn't come up in the presentation, but it was in our uh, gender report, and I just wanted to um, raise it here and a little bit more about the increase in order to um, identify uh, contract consulting assistance with grant proposals with uh, fundraising uh, through the competitive grants that many are out there and I think council member Myers uh, raised the, that that there you know there's a lot of opportunity right now and so taking advantage of that and having more capacity sounds like a important thing a good idea. And I'm just wondering, uh, with respect, um, kind of the decision to do this through uh, contract versus building internal capacity. Um, we have some folks on our staff who are really good at this and understand the funding world in within the sectors in which they operate, um, and they're all they are part of that overextended burnout for working. Um, not enough hours in the day. Um, and so I understand and, and want to support the interest in providing some support for that. But I also think that, you know, we really benefit from those 
uh, members on our staff have developed that capacity and do develop that that understanding. Um, I see it in the other the other agencies that I where I'm a representative of the city. Um, when you have long term staff, really get to know the funding environment, um, what makes grants competitive. Um, that that's really important an asset for the city. So I guess I'm just wondering um, if there is an intention to, um, as part of that, think about a uh, this is this a short term idea or is this um, kind of intended to be a permanent fixture uh, for support to staff or do we want to think about building out staff capacity more fully and how would we do that? Okay, so that's from Brown. I'm going to pull on Lori here in a sec, but I, I want to thank you for the question. And we do have some very talented um, in-house uh, team members that have had a great track record of securing grants. And you're right that they are stretched thin. I know that we have some experienced grant writers on the council as well. I have some interest in wanting to support that work. And we have some tremendous opportunities in front of us that really require, we all know how much participation really effective application together. Staff have been putting a lot of thought uh, into that. And uh, I'll hand it over to Laura to. Thank you. Um, you pretty much summarized everything up. Our existing staff, we have people throughout the city that work as a part of their day-to-day -day job on grants, but our capacity is stretched to its limit. And, and there is also an uptick at the state and federal level of grants that are available out there that we need to go after. So this was our best and shortest, quickest path to be able to get supplemental FTE hours to be able to say, hey, this is what we want to go after, hire grant writing resources and experts to be able to supplement our staff, be under the direction of our subject matter experts in these grant areas, and then go after them, hopefully win them and the response. So um, it's a it's a pilot program. Let's see how it goes. And we'll be able to take that information, that data, figure out what our next step will be. Thank you. Um, I have a question for um, the finance director, Bobby McGee. Uh, have you also, has, has your team started uh, projections on um, um, possible revenue measures and what that might look like? With budget, and uh, specifically if there's a June or November ballot item. Yeah, thank you. Um, we have created some projections um, that we've shared with the, with the ad hoc revenue committee, um, which will now be the ad hoc budget in revenue. Uh, but yes, we are starting to look at that and what the potential revenue sources are and how much that would be. Um, so we've done a little bit of modeling so far, but I will caution it's just modeling at this point. And um, so we have some some ideas on what that would generate and and certainly a revenue measure to go a long way to solving uh, any structural budget deficits as the budget exists. Great. Right. Are there any other questions from the council members? Okay, I uh, will bring it out to public comment. And I will come back for the second part of the item. So, for members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you want to comment on item 21.1, .1, now is the time to call in and Raise your hand by pressing star nine. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted and the timer will then be set for two minutes. Let's see if there are any attendees with their hands raised. This is on item 21.1, fiscal year 2022, budget adjustment. 
and information on city's financial status. I don't see any hands raised. Okay, I will bring it back to council and uh, for deliberation and a motion. There is currently a recommendation to adopt a resolution amending fiscal year 2022 budget appropriations. Um, and there is uh, a second part and a third part authorizes the manager to allocate budgetary changes and receive an update on the city of Santa Cruz finance. And so, member Kalantari Johnson and then member Myers. I'll move the staff recommendation as is in the agenda packet. Would you like me to read it? Please. A motion to adopt a resolution amending fiscal year 2022 budget appropriations to all funds as listed in Exhibit A in the amount of 5,911,511, including 1,450,813 to general fund and the total appropriation estimated revenues as listed in Exhibit A in the amount of 5,273,232 to all funds, including a net reduction of 5,758,501 to the general fund. Catch all those numbers? <laughs> yes. And then part two, authorize the city manager to allocate budgetary changes within the applicable funds and departments. And part three, receive an update on the city of Santa Cruz's financials. Very much. And, and uh, Council Member Myers, did you have? No, I'll just second the motion. Okay. So I have first from Dennis. Member Myers. And now any further discussion, Council Member Cummings? And just revisiting the point I brought up earlier, with, you know, in particular with events coming back online and, you know, because we cut some of those positions of our Parks and Rec staff for working those events and had them move them on to doing other work. Now with events coming back on, and that's just one example, right? But I'm just wondering, you know, how, like what, what we can do, or what the city can do to ensure that you know, this isn't just an ongoing, like, you know, we're not going to overburden our staff right now. And there's funds that have been moved around to address some concern, wondering what can we do, you know, with various departments where they might be feeling like um, there's, a, just, there's work that they've been assigned because of COVID, and now that COVID is easing and some of these, new, these other functions are coming back online, that now they're having to do it kind of both their COVID and pre-COVID kind of work to manage how we can help address that. And the events is in particular because it's like that's something that brings in revenue to the city. So I'm just wondering if maybe that and how we can try to address some of these issues. Uh, thanks for the question, Councilmember Cummings. I, I do think we're entering into a new season of the pandemic as we're able to start offering services and programs in more traditional ways again. Good news. Um, it also means we're going to have to be really intentional about how we rebuild as an organization those programs uh, without point bringing out staff um, or overstretching resources. We want to we want to do provide our services um, at a high standard. Uh, we want to do it well and be intentional as we're rebuilding those programs. That'll be part of our discussion during uh, budget discussions to the council, as well as working that with the departments. And uh, of course, as we do revenue opportunities, that will be a key piece of what that rebuilding looks like. Um, and that we can start um, restarting those programs. Um, so those are already conversations that are underway. Um, and expect uh, more conversations to come as we move into 
strategic planning work that we're all going to be a part of in a couple of months, as well as uh, the budget. I, um, I'll just chime in quickly um, to Council Member Cummings' concern, and I think, I believe we all received some correspondence with concerns um, regarding uh, special events coming back, staffing not coming back um, with it. And so um, I think it's um, important to consider either less special events or or bringing back special event positions um, to uh, accommodate the, the, the support that's needed for special events and the support that's needed for staff that are overworked. Uh, thanks for that, Mayor Burner. I, I think we need to be realistic about what's possible uh, within our resources and for making budget decisions, including around missions. They need to be restored. Special events is one example, but there's many others across all of our departments as well that have had to uh, tighten belts um, the last couple of years. So, you know, we need to just have a, a full conversation uh, with the council uh, and the organization around what those needs and opportunities are. And as you might imagine, there's going to be a lot of new interest. So there will be some hard decisions. Councilmember Cummings. Yeah, to that point, and so I guess the next time, the next opportunity for us to have that conversation is likely going to be the budget. Yeah. When we when we move into the budget period, is that correct? Sorry, I, I missed the first part of your question. I was going to say, you know, in terms of staffing um, level, next time we'll have this conversation is likely going to be budget back to us. It will be part of the budget process. And it, it will also be tied to the strategic planning work we're going to be doing with the council. Ultimately, staffing decisions should be reflective of what the council is telling us are your areas of priority. Um, it's important to me that our operations reflect what you all as policymakers are telling us is important. So the two go hand in hand. I expect that we'll be working on that uh, in parallel. Over the next Great. Um. Yeah, I know, and, and I guess I just say this because um, I know that parks generally one of the departments that gets cut first. And in the report, you know, we're showing that expected revenues are going to be uh, higher than expenditures. Then I think it's any department where we're trying to see if we can help that department meet their staffing needs, especially if it's going to mean that we're going to be able to generate more revenue through that. Um, I think that might be a way, like a you know, first step of kind of um, where these can be made, or if we need to reinstate certain positions, because by reinstating those positions, it actually help us generate the revenue. Yeah, all all of those are important considerations, and we'll absolutely be looking at um, areas, departments that were hardest hit, just because of the unexpected ways that the pandemic has affected our operations, and as we have opportunities to start building back about taking that into account, as well as where we go, you know, what the new normal looks like for our community as we move forward and what those priorities might be. And it's not to say that we might build back in different ways um, and continue to be creative uh, as, as we do so to make sure we're continuing uh, needs. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's definitely a fine balance with community needs and staffing needs. Uh, Council Member or Vice Mayor Martine Watkins. No, oh, thanks. I you know I just appreciate the complexity of the issue and and where we're at, and I just appreciate what you just said, also, Matt. Of my thoughts of how are we being nimble and how are we thinking about things differently in terms of innovation and opportunity, and and how are we also surveying our workforce to see what their needs are. I mean, working alongside of a number of colleagues and friends, I think you know some of their desires have changed. Uh, given the pandemic and their priorities. And as a result, maybe there's opportunity for um, more flex schedules or other types of innovations or shared contracts or whatnot. So I guess all that to say is, I think moving forward as we revisit sort of our strategic plan priorities and 
sort of opportunity here with innovation. I, I just want to kind of put a, you know, an exclamation point as um, wanting to see support around that. Okay, um, we have a motion. Uh, a staff recommended motion was made by Councilmember Calendar Johnson, seconded by Councilmember Myers. And I'd like to ask the city clerk for a roll call vote. Thank you, Member Calendar Johnson. Aye. Boulder? Aye. Coming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Meyer? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. Mayor Bird? Aye. That motion passes unanimously. Thank you, thank you, Interim Finance Director Bobby McGee. And Lupita is, was here. Thank you, Lupita, for all of your work as well. Uh, moving on to item number 21.2 on the agenda. Resolution amending the City of Santa Cruz personnel complement and classification and compensation plans for the Park and Recreation Finance, Fire, and Water Department budget adjustment. And we have with us uh, our Human Resources Director, Lisa Murphy, for a presentation. Uh, go ahead, Lisa. Yeah. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor members. This item is basically a procedural item implementing the actions that you just previously took on the year budget. These items here with personnel changes, we like to pull them out separately uh, so that you can see the individual changes. There is no general fund impact making these adjustments. However, there is an impact to the enterprise funds in the water with an addition of a principal management analyst. And what I'd like to do is uh, Get the will of the council. Would you like me to go through each of these changes, or would you uh, like to forego a present presentation and go to consideration, or just ask questions? Um, I would uh, prefer a presentation uh, to the items. Um, I don't. I know I spoke to you earlier, and it wasn't very long, so I think uh, the information would be helpful to set the context. Certainly. So with, I can put the item, let me share my, um, I'll just run through, I hope I think that you can all see my screen. This is the resolution that's before you. Several of these changes are uh, administrative because you had already approved them in a previous budget. We are simply um, effectuating the change and that would be the building maintenance worker one. With regards to the job title change supervisor, we really found that, that uh, the classification is very outdated in the title and it doesn't reflect the job duties appropriately. So we worked with the uh, incumbents and the uh, union to update that title to be more reflective of a more professional series as administrative services supervisor. There is no change to the job duties and there is no change to compensation. In finance, an opportunity to take a look and see how things were uh, uh, implemented in or under a previous administration. Uh, Bobby has taken a look and made some recommended changes to the finance department. What he'd like to do is add back in a purchasing manager and to offset those costs, delete a purchasing assistant and delete a county technician to fund the purchasing manager position. Bobby and his staff has reviewed this and feel that this is the best operational uh, to function for that uh, particular department. And then with regards to fire, we currently are asking for two unfunded firefighter positions 
And what this does for the fire department is allow the flexibility, particularly because they have academies they run and they're only they're on a time cycle. And when we have an individual who may retire and then we have a gap, we'd like to try to fill that spot with somebody by putting them in the academy. These are not funded. They are typically funded though through uh, vacancy savings. But again, it allows us to keep a full complement of staff when their vacancies from a retirement or even from um, a, a, a workers' comp issue, if somebody might be going out, but and then we want to run, like I said, an academy and we can slot two people in uh, without the um, disruption to the continuity of services. Currently have one, so adding two more, particularly in this upcoming cycle where we are projecting a uh, six retirement. So this is really gonna allow us the flexibility to fund that. And then finally, we have our water position. And again, this is not within the general fund, but as you've seen in previous presentations from the water department with the capital projects they're undertaking, the amount of workload that's occurring there, they are looking to add additional principal management and to assist in, in the management of those, um, those projects. And the amount for that position position is 189550 and that includes all salaries and benefits. Again, this position is working on over $80 million of programs that they'll be. So again, as a reminder, this has no impact to the general fund. Uh, it's cost neutral with the exception of the enterprise funds. And that concludes uh, the, my presentation. And I'd be happy to entertain any questions. Thank you so much, Director Murphy. Are there any council members with questions? Item one. Okay. At this time, then I will take it out for public comment. Thank you so much for that presentation. If you're interested in commenting on item 21.2, part of the mid-year update, press star nine on your phone to raise your hand. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. The timer will then be set for two minutes. And we have attendees, whoever knows, Hands are raised. If you'd like to comment on this item, press star nine. Press raise hand on your computer. Okay, a few more seconds. We'll bring it back to council. See any attendees? Hand raised. So Vice Mayor Watts, and then Council Member. Thanks, Mayor. Yeah, no, I'm happy to move the recommendation as written in our um, agenda report as well. Um, so the recommendation is um, to, one, adopt a resolution amending the classification and compensation plans in the mid-year fiscal year 2022 budget personnel complement by the approving position changes in our four city departments and to a resolution amending the fiscal year 2022 budget to appropriate funds for the addition of a principal management analyst within the water department. That's my motion. Member Brown. I'll second that. First, Vice Mayor Watts. Second with Brown. Any discussion, further deliberation? Yeah, I'd like to ask the city clerk for a roll call vote. Member Terry Johnson? Aye. Sir? Aye. Coming? Aye. Brown? Aye. Myers? Aye. Vice Mayor Watkins? Aye. 
hair burner. Hi. That motion passes unanimously. We are now at the last item of our agenda, or following the last item of our agenda, the oral communications. For members of the public who are streaming this meeting, if you would like to comment during oral communications, now is the time to call in. Instructions are on your screen. Oral communication is an opportunity for members of the community to comment on items that were not on the agenda. If you are interested in addressing the council, press star nine to raise your hand. You will have two minutes to speak. When it is your time to speak, you will hear an announcement that you have been unmuted. We request that you clearly and slowly state your name before making your comment so that we can accurately capture in the meeting minutes. However, it's not required. Please remember this is a time for council to hear from the public on items that were not on the agenda. We are not able to engage in dialogue with each member of the public, but when we are able, we will address the questions raised after oral communications has been made. Okay, attendees, I have one caller with their hand raised. I am watching you is the name. Go ahead and. Uh, hi, I've been sitting on a myths of black history speech for a year, but I'll wait on that one. Instead, I once again offer my annual suggestion of a mayoral proclamation of a black man appreciation day, but hey, just don't make it April 1st, you know? On a different, seemingly minor, but not to me issue, it did not go unnoticed that the city decided to eliminate the four extra green service and one extra refuse pickup or self-transport to the dump tags that normally have been mailed to customers in the past. Like the shrinking candy bar, we now pay more for less, or in this case, nothing. The messaging was unclear if one will now have to call someone for four or three extra bag pickups but for sure the once yearly included truckload of refuse and up to four picked up loads of green waste is no more. Considering the city doesn't have to do almost anything if I transport and dump yard waste, which you turn into compost with some value, the pennies you say you are saving on a half page of paper seems like a dissembling nonsense excuse for less service. Maybe it hasn't occurred to you, but people don't like to go on solo trips to the dump with minor amounts of toxic waste like fluoresce bulbs, batteries, and other items, even if they're accepted for free. They want to make one big trip with everything, including maybe some refuse that isn't normally free, and the once yearly service tag did that. I see a plenty more free junk on the sidewalks in your future. Unless people can get value for dumping, they may just let refuse or anything else accumulate in those previous few extra service tags kept the city conveniently cleaner than it almost certainly will be now. Municipal utilities are not a cash cow to be milked, and again, your cost was minimal when the users did the transport. While it might not be practical since Santa Cruz streets are not laid out or as rich a city as Santa Clara, there, once a year, dump all you want into the street the city takes it away works very well there. Scavengers look the stuff over and some things are recycled that way, and then what absolutely nobody wants is efficiently hauled off. It keeps that city very clean. Thank you. Thank you for your oral communication. Are there any other attendees that would like to call in for oral communication? These are items that were not on today's agenda. Okay, I wonder if, um, our public works director is still here, or um, anyone is here that speak to the four tags, or the, the extra load tags that uh, public works sends out. Are you holding one up, Council Member Golder? Yeah. So it it was in I forget what it was what it came in the Santa Cruz Re, uh, Refuse and Recycling Newsletter, and it it says previously known as free service tags, and it says. To reduce waste, revamp the extra service tax. We'll no longer mail coupons. Um, and then there's a clip coupon here. But Mr. Phillips was right in that there used to be 
four, and then there's just the one here. And um, so, but there was something else. So I say that I love the double. Thank you, Council Member Golder. And I see uh, Director uh, Dettel, Mark Dettel of Public Works. Um, there was oral communications regarding. Uh, right. I did hear that. Um, system just went off. But um, there, just to clear up the misconception, the, the service is not, not stopped. Um, what staff did is they got rid of the paper waste sending out tag so um you can keep put the bags out by your your bin and we keep track of how many you get up to the four a year um it's electronically captured if you have a bulk item you can call and arrange to have that picked up so the service is there we're trying to make it so that um we're not sending out more waste more paper waste for you but um it sounds like the communication could have been better it was in the newsletter we are adding that to the city's main page of the website. Let people know, and uh, we'll be trying to get that information out further. But we just had that discussion this week because I got an email question. I already saw it on next door where somebody had thought that he had to eliminate that. But thank you for the opportunity. I appreciate the the oral communication to give me the opportunity to share that with people that that service is still there. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chris. Appreciate it. Uh -huh. Okay. It looks like that's it for oral communication. And that concludes our city council meeting for today. Thank you, everybody. Have a wonderful evening. This meeting is now adjourned. Night. Night.